fucking song written for me about me, all about me, the Big Jim Show. Apologies for that, slightly egotistical, but welcome to the Sugar Club. I should say welcome, I should say thank you for having me, because this is your home city of Dublin. It's great to be back. Normally I'll be with my partner in crime, but it's solo. It's the Big Jim Show. So as egotistical as that sounds, it's not all about me this evening. But for those of you who don't know me and got bought a terrible Christmas present because it was last minute, been brought in. My name is Jim Hamilton, one of the greatest Scotland players who have ever done it. So the laughter shows that some of you know who I am, the rest it's like, is he being serious? Absolutely not, one of the worst who have ever done it. But it's awesome to be here tonight, it's a Tuesday night, I know it's not as rock and roll as a Friday or a Saturday, but this place, this stage here, this is rock and roll. Apparently, Sinead O'Connor, back in the day, stood in this very spot. Now the great Jim Hamilton is stood here. So I'm going to welcome to the stage someone who knows a little bit about our rugby. He's been around the block a little bit. Put your hands together for double World Cup winner, yep. Stephen Getty gets off. Enjoyed the song, you enjoyed your walk on, you've got a microphone there, I think, Steve. Uh, yeah, that's brilliant. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Great to be here. Uh, just firstly, before we introduce um, the man of the moment, it's not basically you're the man of the moment, you're the double World Cup winner. How are you enjoying your time? How are you, sorry, Matt, how are you enjoying your time in Ireland? You've obviously signed for Ulster, we were talking about it backstage, the relief that you're now getting, not seeing the sun without stereotyping. <laughs> has been a welcome break. How are you enjoying your time in Belfast, in Ireland? Um, no, it's been brilliant. Um, yeah, it's much easier to train in 2 degrees, 3 degrees compared to back home in 30, 35 degrees. So, no, I've been loving it. Uh, Belfast is awesome city, so, but yeah, it's just awesome to be in Ireland and play some quality rugby. I love that. Belfast is an awesome city and there was complete silence. <laughs> I know we're in Dublin, but I lived in Northern Ireland. I've travelled a little bit, but uh, Stephen Christopher, it's great to have you. So, our next guest, we're going to announce him. He is the Red Bull athlete. He's a lot more than that. He's the Australian turned Irish. I'm going to tell you, he's a legend. He's won man of the match in every single game that he's played for Ireland. He's fresh. He is fresh out of the operating theatre from surgery yesterday. Put your hands together for the Mac Attack, Mac Hansen. Uh, but, uh, what was your what was your walk on tune? Uh, Creed, higher. We didn't really let it get to where I wanted. Thanks for that. But yeah, no <laughs> worries. That's fine. How cool is this, by the way? How cool is it to be? Uh, can I say it's cool to be in Dublin, Matt? Do you like it here? I know that you're a West Side, you're a West Country man over in Connacht. Do you like coming to Dublin? I do. I um, I don't know if anybody saw. Same again, my Instagram stories on the weekend. I enjoy Dublin a little too much uh, whenever I come up here, but uh, no, it's good. It's always good to be in Dublin. Well, it's talking about your Instagram. You posted a post yesterday when you were fresh out of surgery and looking well, looking to be back very soon. I mean, you looked, sorry, Stephen, you looked paler than Stephen, but like, that's what I thought on there. You didn't look well. You didn't look like a well man. You've just had surgery. This is great commitment. I know it's not to the big gym show, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the Wings for Life, that's why you're here, but unbelievable commitment because you only had surgery yesterday and I know that it got announced, anyone who watched the, the, the game that you were playing in where you dislocated your shoulder and the pain that you were in, we were all hoping that it wasn't as bad as it has turned out to be, but maybe just give the millions of people in the room a kind of understanding. I'll tell you, the queue at the door, they're desperate to get in it. Um, just give them an idea of how bad the injury is and like how you are. Uh, yeah, no, unfortunately it was... Um end up being a little bit worse than I thought, so um, it's going to be about three or four months uh, rehab, but look, it could be worse, it could be worse, um, it's not a Rico or anything like that, um, yeah, no, I'm going to be missing out on the Six Nations and all those sort of things, but I get to do things like this instead now, so it's perfect. Of course, well that's yeah, with you, Jim, all the time. Well, I know, me and you are like best mates, so if people don't understand the, the relationship that me and Mac Hansen have, it all stemmed from a bet that we had on the rugby pod that I do with my partner in crime, Andy Goode. And basically, 
out of nowhere, out of nowhere, we just had Mac on. I know that he was into his tattoos and stuff, and we had a, this ridiculous bet. If you're Scottish, it's ridiculous that Scotland would beat Ireland in the Six Nations. That's what I said. Crazy, yeah. crazy. Well, that, <laughs> what a loyal. Fucking bet for him. Loyal. Loyal. And Max says, yeah, I'll take that bet. Of course he fucking did. So he's like, I'm going to take the bet. Ireland will beat Scotland. I said, well, what are we going to bet on it? All right, banter, lads. We're going to put a tattoo on it. So I've now got Big Mac tattooed on the inside of the arrow. Man of my word. Man of my word. Um, I'd, I'd make a bet with uh, Stephen here as well, but I don't want him to get a tattoo. You got, I know you're world champions and everything, but you can't seem to beat us, so it's one of them. Yeah, well, <laughs> We are going to get into that. Um, Wins for Life, I gave a horrible introduction. Now, I'm happy to call it out. I'm fresh to it. But Wins for Life, okay, that's who we're supporting this evening. So there's a world run on May the 5th. So I don't know if anyone knows about what's happening, but throughout the evening, we are going to talk about how spinal injuries can affect people all over the world. I've got three people very close to me in all different ways in which they broke their neck. A good friend of mine, Matt Hampson, it was in a scrum. Um, and he's now a quadriplegic and has got a fantastic foundation in the middle of Leicester. And there's another guy that played rugby that did it not play in rugby or training. He was a, a guy called Ed Jackson. He dived into a swimming pool. And a good friend of mine's brother, as well, at the age of 17, went on a lad's holiday and dived into the sea, which is the most common way, actually, that people could break their necks. Dived into the sea, hit a seabed, broke his neck, and uh, is paralysed from the neck down. So this is something that affects people from all walks of life, whether or not you're playing in sport. And the one thing that I was chatting to my mate Matt Hansen about when initially when it happened to him, um, obviously is the devastation, but he felt like he was one of the lucky ones because of the people that he had around him, the money that was kind of put into trying to help, help him, literally, no pun intended, he always speaks about this, get back on his feet, which he never managed to do. But one thing that, that lives across all of the, the people that you speak to that have been affected by these injuries is hope. It's hoped that one day there would be a cure, the research will be there to try and find something that will help these people, walk. whether or not it's now, next year, in 20 years' time, these people hold on to this hope. So we will talk about it, but there's a QR code that goes around, so if the show's shit tonight, just scan the QR code, you can mess around on there. Every single pound and euro that was spent tonight to come here is going into that pot to find research. The QR code will get you involved in the world run, we're going to talk about that. You get yourself an Adidas t-shirt when you sign up as well. I've been guaranteed that it's Adidas and not Adi Hashley. You're getting a genuine, <laughs> genuine Adidas t-shirt as well. And we can get to a little bit more about that. But Stephen, I just wanted to show you because you weren't too sure about the big gym show. I've talked myself up there. But we've got a clip that I wanted to show you about how good this guy in this chair is, is at predicting, <laughs> predicting things in rugby. We've got the clip. Let's just show This is a podcast that I did with my mate John Barkley. Here we go, let's see if the tax working is frozen. Who do you reckon will do well? In the World Cup? You reckon Wales will? I think they'll get out of the pool, mm. which I think they would take as success probably. Um, who's going to do well at the World Cup? New Zealand? Yes. Called it. France? Ireland? Yes. Or one of them three down in the court? Not exactly. Yeah. It's a couple, probably not. Well, maybe, you don't know. Do you think we're the best we've ever been? I think they'll be South Africa. Oh, I said the same, John. Did you? Scotland beat the world champion. <laughs> I think so. Right. So this has got nothing to do with self-promotion because whoever's spoken on that podcast hasn't got a fucking clue about rugby. Mate, I said this before the World Cup, Mr. Ketsam. I said, I don't know why, blind loyalty. I've got a tattoo with a big Mac on my arm. I said that Scotland would beat South Africa. I don't know if the lads saw that. I don't know whether that fired them. I don't know what happened, but it was a ridiculous statement. I'm sat here with a double winning world champion and there's a load more we were talking weren't we backstage it's like you've won the urc you've won the champ none of that matters mate you've won the world cup twice back to back how does it feel not just sat here tonight in dublin how do you walk around with that is it something that you smile about all the time i just want to get a sense on how that feels as a young man yeah i know so that exact clip was played about 100 times <laughs> in the build up to, to the Scotland game but um, no, no, thank you very much no, it's like, for me it was just being part of the World Cup it's, it's honor, like a big honour for me and then going to win it twice in a row it's, no, it's unbelievable and um, it's definitely like more than a dream come true so it's, there was a lot of hard work and sacrifice that went into it went, went into it and just the amount of effort and just not from the players but like management coaches 
um, all parties involved to make make the su success was 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 magical and um, yeah, I'm just so proud to be be South African and, and be part of such an awesome team. Yeah, absolutely. Are, are there any South Africans in the room? Woo! Yeah. A few hundred, a few hundred, <laughs> enjoying that. You get us everywhere. That's absolutely fine. Um, going back to back, and maybe this is just me saying this, and you've seen the bollocks that I spout there, so I haven't got a clue. Maybe there's an argument to say that the pressure that you weren't under going into the World Cup made it potentially easier, because all the pressure was on the world number one, Ireland, the pool of death that South Africa were in, that it almost felt like under the radar a little bit, which is crazy to say with the current world champions. Did you feel that, or, or was there a huge pressure in the squad to go back to back? Yeah, there was. Uh, there's massive pressure to, to go back to back, and then, uh, like almost leading up to it, there was a lot of eyes on us. Uh, are they going to dethrone South Africa as the champions? And we knew we were in the pool of death. We had Ireland, and uh, but we knew we just had to win three of our four games to make it into the playoffs, and then anything can happen. Like if you go to play off rugby. Um, bounce of a ball, I mean, three games by one point is, I mean, you can't write that, that, that kind of script. So it was like we just knew we had to get out of our pool and it was a pool of death and um, we managed to claw our way through and then get a, get a seat at the, at, the, at the quarterfinal and just fought our way all the way to the top. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, all the way to the top. And with that, in the pool of death, that game against Ireland, which was absolutely phenomenal, I was there pitch side, it was amazing to be out, Matt, we spoke about it and we will talk about it as well. How did that affect the group? Because that was the, like people was talking about, whoever wins that game are going to be favourites, right? I know there was a lot to get through, but what was the mood like? What was the energy like? In, I mean, in the stadium, you will remember the, the zombie yeah. tune, the song that went viral across the world off the back of that. It was trending on Spotify after, that's how kind of culturally relevant that game became. How did you feel as a team after that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's going to sound a bit weird, but like, I felt like there was a bit of fuel on the fire. So it was like almost like a wake-up call and saying, this here. Like, the game was so close, it could have gone any way. Like, a couple of kicks here for us or another score for Ireland, and it could have gone either, like, even further, or we couldn't have gotten a bonus point out of it. But it was, I think, when we got back to, to the hotel that evening, and um, Rassi just called everyone in and said, let's see, we're going to have a quick team meeting. Um, he just said, like, this feeling you feel now, like, let's not feel this again for the rest of the World Cup. Um, and I think it just, like, fueled the way we got re-energized, uh, went to training on Monday and just came out with, like, new aspirations and hope and guys were just willing to work and go the extra mile for, for the bigger, for the main picture and the bigger goal that we try to achieve that World Cup. Awesome. Come in, lads. <laughs> did a, just did an unbelievable introduction, basically. <laughs> Scan the QR code. You're joining a run on May the 5th. <laughs> Global, and you get an Adidas t-shirt as well. It's a genuine one. They're coming in. Mac, oh, sorry, no, just before I come on to you. So when Rassi had that chat with you, we know that Rassi's a little bit loose. You know when, like, zombie, zombie. Did he come into the lads and say, look, right, when we get to the end of the tournament, that tune needs to be changed to Rassi. Did he say that zombie <laughs> needs to be mixed into Rassi? Rassi, Rassi. Oh, we can't do that. No, we're going to get booed off stage. <laughs> Not only do you play at Ulster, you can't say that here. But there's a few South Africans, and South Africans are bloody hard as well. Like, you've seen the size of them, so you can do whatever you want. But, Matt, we've spoken about it, and I know it's a little bit of old news, but until the Six Nations comes around, it still lives in the memory of Irish fans, because the build-up to the World Cup over the last few years, and I'm speaking for you here, so then you can just kind of go into it, but just to set the scene, World number one, having done what you did in New Zealand, which was to go down there and beat the All Blacks on home soil, Grand Slam champions, but there was always that thing, wasn't there? Like, whether or not they were talking about it in camp, like, but we were talking about it, weren't we, as well? The quarterfinal hoodoo that everyone was talking about. Everything was building up. Unless you're a Scotland fan, everyone thought Ireland were going to get out of their pool. But after you beat South Africa, it was like, holy shit. Like, we're now potentially looking at Ireland doing it. Then you get to the quarters. Just give us an idea as a player how the emotions were going into the World Cup, the expectations of a nation, the fact that you were so good. Maybe just set the scene for us as a, as a player feeling that pressure. Yeah, look, I, I don't think... Uh, look, we let New Zealand get out to a fast start, which is never going to help. Um, they're a great side. They're, they've been on top of the world for a, 
for plenty of years, um, you know, all the way through rugby. So whenever that happens, it makes it a little bit harder to dig um, dig out of, but we did that. Um, I don't think that we let it get to our heads. We, we weren't really thinking about the voodoo or anything like that. I just think, um, unfortunately, they were just slightly better on the day. Like, it was a game of margins, the same one as, as uh, Steve said it here on uh, when we played them. You know, it could have gone either way. Um, and yeah, just it happened to go that way for, for New Zealand. That's how I felt. I, um, we're obviously gutted at the way we went out and um, felt we kind of let a lot of people down in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the quarters there. But I think when I've had time to reflect on it a lot more, um, you know, I'm still incredibly proud of what we did. Um, and yeah, as I said, I, I don't think we let it get too big to our heads. I just think it was a good game of footy and um, New Zealand was just slightly better on the day. This is something we were talking about on the, the podcast that we did. Like when you assess the World Cup after, and everyone talks about, especially in South Africa, about uniting a nation, having the fans, having everyone follow you. And we were talking about it. And being in the stadium, I don't know if anyone, I'm sure a few people in here can see a few quid in here, uh, went to the World Cup. <laughs> expensive, <laughs> expensive. Hey, no transport, you pay a fortune for the ticket, you can't get back to your hotel, I'm not bothered, loaded, so it doesn't matter. But when, the people, when you're there, like it genuinely felt, well the energy was completely taken out of the World Cup because of where it was in France when France and Ireland came out, but it felt like the country stuck with you after, they could see how much effort was put in, they can see how good you are, and you're an easy team to follow, right? Did you feel that with the fans? Yeah, we didn't feel like anybody, like, all the messages this I got especially were, um, they were all, yeah, there was no, no one was hating, I think everybody was, well, you can speak on that behalf. Uh, I think everyone was proud and felt, that's how we kind of felt when we came home, we understood everyone was disappointed, but um, what we wanted to achieve was to get everybody in the country really into rugby again, and, um, you know, when you see some of the videos of our mad bastard fans, like, Packing scrums against cars in France and holding up traffic, you know, just literally taking over all of Paris. When we um, were saying in the Moulin Rouge, there was that one guy wearing a mankini with one bollock hanging out. <laughs> with a rugby ball, but it was like a massive blow-up uh, Guinness thing and he's sidestepping cars. And you could just literally just see one bollock. It was an absolute mayhem. I don't know if many of us are allowed back in Paris ever again. After. But look, you know, you look at things like that and that's... That's all we wanted to get out of. We just wanted people to fall in love with rugby. Um, uh, and, you know, as I said, it didn't, it didn't happen our way. We didn't get the win, but um, from the kind of reception we got when we came home and from talking to people, it still um, gave people lifelong memories that they could enjoy. So, um, yeah, look, there's plenty more World Cups to come. And, uh, look, yeah, it was, it, it was what it was. Oh, we're not leaving it now. We're not just leaving it there, mate. We're no going. one else has saved you. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm depressed. It makes me upset. Yeah, I, I'm, I know it does. I know it does. But mate, you're, mate, you're fine. We're going to build it up after. I know the Six Nations, but we said we're, we're going to go on the road and we're going to do stuff during the Six Nations as well. But that All Blacks game, watching the last passage of 133 phases of whatever it was, Jack Owen didn't have. He had one boot on, and he's carried the ball about 32 times. You think about the small margins in, in, in rugby, right? And everyone speaks about it. It's a cliche saying. I think it was Ronan Kelly got held up over the line, right, against the All Blacks in that match. Like, we're talking inches, a matter of inches in, in them games. Like, what... It's easy, like, what, what do you say? Like, what do you do off the back of that? But, like, you come in the changing rooms and it's the quarter final again. What does... Is there a debrief around that? Like, how do you... Un unpick that because it's um, it. we were speaking about it and I know this having been to two World Cups for Scotland you're in it and then the day after look you're nodding you're in, you don't know you don't know this <laughs> you fucking don't know, <laughs> don't know he's not there you know to make things even worse they actually took our hotel when we left as well <laughs> we moved out they moved in I know but that's but how do you think it's great that is absolutely ruthless actually funny story I actually feel quite bad saying this but I went to the World Cup in 2011 this is how bad it is and we got stitched up by Wayne Barnes, but we played against Argentina. <laughs> Scotland should have been through to the quarters. We weren't. We got knocked out by Argentina. And it, the game was on Saturday night. Sunday night, I'm on a flight home, right? And I, and we, this is how about it. We went home. We were going home with the Georgians. Basically, we're on the same flight. And they're lovely people, the Georgians. Don't get me wrong. 
And I felt really bad because they turned right on the plane because I was vice captain for Scotland. They asked me if I wanted to go left. And I'm sat in first class having just been embarrassed at the World Cup. But as brutal and as like ruthless as it is, so they take your, your hotel, you're out. How, how do you unpick that? Like, what's said? Because this is what we spoke about is, and having spoken to Andrew Porter about it as well, people deal with it. Like you've, you've taken a, a, a kind of different take on it. Johnny Sexton retires, you know, Peter Omani, as emotional as he, as he is. Across the board, what, what was said? Like how did, you know, were people wrecking the plane on the way home? Like, you know, what was what the fans said? Um, was anybody on that plane home? Yeah. The same plane as us? Yeah. yeah, then you probably know, yeah, that there was semantics going on on the plane. Bundy RK took over the, um, was it the intercom? For a good bit there? Intercom, yeah. Yeah, he, he was... seems quite straight laced, by the way, whenever I <laughs> As he reaches for his whiskey and red um, I, like straight after the game, everybody's obviously incredibly pressed and um, not feeling too great. But Faz just, he kind of just said, he was like, there's nothing, nothing we can do about it now. That, like, that's sport. That's what, exactly what happens. He, he just made a point of make sure we were getting around each other. And um, for the next, I think we stayed on another day or two, so we didn't leave straight away. Um, but yeah, he just made a point about just getting around each other and trying to enjoy the rest of it while we could, um, which we definitely did. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, that was kind of it. It was just, yeah, it was just trying to make sure that everybody was sort of okay. We knew that um, the feelings were, were down massively, but um, even when we got home, I think we were home for a day and then we went back up to Johnny's. Um, and it was honestly like I hadn't seen those guys in a couple of years. Um, don't just quickly go from... over that. You went, went around Johnny's, yeah? I don't see that. So you went to Johnny Sexton's Palace, which is just down the road. It's got to be worth at least $10 million. Of course it is. <laughs> Everything's diamonds and gold. And it's crazy. This is um, our slide, because you didn't give me enough of this when we spoke about it. So you've gone around Johnny Sexton's house for a debrief. Yeah. I imagine Peter Romani's on his hands and knees in the garden, right? Just sort of... <laughs> Matt straight in the fridge, unleashing on the beers. We know that Gary, is it Gary Ringrose, he didn't like a drink, does he? His dad was yeah, forced yeah, to after loves the drink. grand step. Oh, does he? Everybody, everybody in the team likes a good drink. Uh, you know, we go there. Um, I literally remember walking in and like, um, just, we all just started hugging. It was really, it was really weird actually, why I think so. <laughs> yeah. Just hugging, going, oh, I love you, I miss you so much, sort of thing. Because, um, you know, as, as I said, we were to, like, you're together with these blokes. Um, it ended up being 18 weeks. We were together pretty much every day, hanging out with each other, and, and then you go home, and even if it was a day, but that, that day at home was grim, very grim. Um, yeah, you go from that to not seeing them very often. Um, it's weird, like it's a weird thing, and uh, yeah, I'd say even, even when you win the thing, it's, it must be strange coming home. He, he can talk about that. But, um, yeah, so that was the whole thing. The whole, the whole th point of afterwards was definitely, you know, enjoying what we achieved. Um, try, and, try not to dive into it too much because there's no answers that we could give. And just, um, just enjoy it. Just enjoy each other's company for the rest of the time that we could. Yeah. So talking about enjoying it, Stephen, there was loads of stuff. It's so good with social media. It's almost like you can just be at home just watching what everyone's getting up to. We saw all the celebrations. We're talking about what you got up to. We can talk about the tattoos and stuff like that. Yeah, that, yeah, cool. Just getting the nod off one of the producers. Just quickly before that, we want to talk about how the South Africans celebrate. But can we just roll the video because this this clip went viral after, and Stephen Kitsop said he's going to repeat the antics of Trevor and Carney. So if we could just play this this video here, South African fans. So that did about 40 million views, not that that's the thing, you can't monetize any of that, you can just see a happy man, but the celebrations like we saw on the pitch and I suppose where it was, because the game, the final was in Paris and because France were out, because Ireland were out, the South Africans we know that they like to travel, but the celebrations that we saw with the players is, is natural, but you went home to South Africa, right, and it just looked unbelievable just give us a kind of quick line on that because we've got a couple of special guests started in now yeah so first of all i can't move like that it's <laughs> I, my body's not built for that but um yeah so like we spend 
uh, had a massive night like after the final and um, pretty much went through the night, uh, went to the rugby awards, carried on through that night as well, got on a plane, landed back in Joburg and then the tattoo artist came, tattooed a couple of boys and uh, pretty much just went on a trophy tour from there on, onwards and it was absolute carnage for, for about a week. Uh, and then like eventually by the end of the week I was just like, okay boys, I'm I've had enough. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. 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 Uh, I've had enough. Um, I'm going to see you boys in um, June, July next year again, hopefully. And then, yeah, that's pretty much how I said goodbye. I, just, <laughs> I physically couldn't drink anymore. And um, yeah, I just found my missus so the same couple of me up. What tattoos did you get? What tattoos did you get? Um, yeah, so I just got, uh, I got the World Cup on my butt. And, <laughs> And then I've just got two stars underneath. Oh. Yeah. That's because they, they've won it twice. Just, <laughs> yeah, just won it twice. That's you won it three times. Just if you if you weren't known, you got bought a ticket for Christmas, and it's not what you wanted. So, double World Cup winner. So I love that. Who, uh, are we ready to dial in the guests? Because I saw something. Just give me a kind of a shout, a holler, if that's what's happening. Yeah. Yeah, we are. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Um, just on, on that then, so you mentioned he got a little bit loose. I was hearing Sia Khaleesi was off his absolute rocker on the way around. He's a, he's a, he's a bit of a loose guy, isn't he? No, he's a, a great captain, but uh, he loves, loves having a good time, but always in control. Yeah, you can't trust him. Good timing, lads. Good timing. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. QR code's on the table. That's how you want to do. So on that then, so... Rassi as well, he seems like a good lad, he looks like he enjoys himself, if anyone saw the, the clip of him coming through the airport and the emotion, because he, he has this kind of, well of course, this kind of hard exterior, he's a little bit loose on social media, but he has this hard exterior, but you just saw what it meant, just everyone talks about it means more in South Africa, just give us an idea of what that actually means. Yeah, I think um, Rassi like, truly, truly cares about the stream box and, um, and what they stand for, so... I think when you see those, those emotions, it's like all that hard work and, and sacrifice that went into the like, last four, se or four years to build up to this moment, um, I think it's almost just like relief. And so he just truly cares so much about the box and the success of, of SA Rugby and Rugby and Rugby. So yeah, um, no, you, just, like, you can see those emotions pour out when, when he gets a bit of that success. Yeah, absolutely. Where does South Africa go from here? Because it's almost like, how do you back that up? I know the obvious thing is, is this dynasty that, that people speak about, but it's almost like you go into the next World Cup now and there isn't a huge amount of pressure because you've won it back to back. In fact, what's going on here? We've got messages up on screen. We'll come back to that. Jack, can you hear me? Hello, mate. Hello. For anyone who doesn't know, he's got his hood up. He looks like a gangster, but that's a Red Bull athlete. That's Jack Noel. He's obviously not Irish, but anyway, do we know that this is him? Yeah, Jack, that's for you as well, mate. Don't worry. <laughs> mate, we're going to introduce you both. Shall we just try something new? Mate, this is the Big Jim Show Live, so this could go anyway. So for those of you who can't see him, let's have a look. I'm going to kind of give you a gauge on what's going on. The great to see you, Khaleesi. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. How are you, Jimmy? I'm very good. Let me just try and turn my camera on so you can oh, see me. Yeah. Be a bit weird. Ah, yeah. there we go. We've got you. Can you see oh, the beards? Yeah. 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 I love that little bit of French. Um, Sia, we'll just start with you. So I know we've not got you for long, so I'm going to keep you on here. It might be a little bit weird, but I'm here with Stephen Kitsoff, who said that you got pretty loose after winning the double. <laughs> Yes, of course. The board, the board, of course, we had to. It was, it was big. Um, I think, um, yeah, the, that was definitely the toughest World Cup, like the toughest period, if you like, we can call it as a group. Um, I mean, the, the road that we had to go through to get to the, to, to the win was huge, and I think it took a lot out of us. Yeah, absolutely. Jack, how are you, mate? How was things over there? You with Ronan O'Gara? Is he? Had Johnny Sexton over for dinner or anything like that? Has he made some of him now? Is he liking it now he's retired? What's Rog saying to everything? If he's had him over, mate, I've not been invited over yet, so um, <laughs> I must have missed out on that one. But now, mate, it's good, mate. It's awesome. I'm loving it here. Um, nursing a broken hand at the moment, but uh, a couple of weeks I should be back there. 
Yeah, so we've got about two million people in the room, two people are English in here, so they just wanted to get a quick idea. How the hell, how the hell did England make it to the semis? <laughs> It was all part of the plan, mate. It was all part of the plan. The Six Nations and then was trying to peak in the World Cup. Is that, and how are you enjoying it? So you're at La Rochelle, talking to go back to back, back to back Champions Cup, Ronan O'Gara, great coach, listed with brilliant players. How are you enjoying it there, mate? How's your French? Uh, I'm loving it, mate, to be fair. Uh, um, it, it's good fun. It's a bit, uh, a bit of fresh air for me. Obviously, spending you know, 13 years at Exeter. Um, but yeah, different environment, obviously different country and stuff like that, but I, I'm loving it, mate. The boys are class. Uh, Big Rogers is awesome as well. Um, yeah, the only thing that's not going to well at the moment is my French, but uh, two lessons. Uh, my my five-year-old daughter is better than me. Hey, that's fine. They, they, they absorb stuff just quicker, that's what I said. So, I, all I knew in French was, je suis Jim, which means I am Jim. Um, <laughs> je suis fatigué, which means I am tired. And Jay Fab, which means I'm hungry, so that's all I got. See it? I can see a lovely little bit of product placement there, and I'm not talking about the Red Bull hat. You got some baguettes in the back, have you been that? It's actually the biggest problem for me here in Florence. Um, eating too much baguettes. And you know what I've heard? There's a tradition if you go buy a baguette at the shop, you have to eat one another way. So I finish one, then I eat one later, and then I eat one. With, with uh, strawberry jam and, and butter, bro, it goes, it goes to London. That's absolutely... Hey, you've got a million followers on Instagram, so you can do whatever you want here. So, oh my goodness. having won the World Cup back to back as captain, like, be honest, was it winning the World Cup or was it your Instagram followers going over a million? Which made you happier? Come on, come on. Let me the World Cup yesterday. When you say that, you could have done the James Haskell approach and bought 250,000 from Indonesia. <laughs> They love rugby in Indonesia, they really do. Trust me, they're all my followers as well. But see, we want to hear a little bit more from you, mate. So you are now at Racing 92, Stuart Lancaster's there. Everything and all the hysteria around the World Cup, has it been a welcome rest being in France, being, I suppose, out of the spotlight of being home in South Africa is what I'm trying to ask. Um, it's definitely been different. Um, it's definitely been different. Um, it's, as Jake said, it's really tough. The toughest thing for me is the language which makes the rugby even more tough because, you know, you're learning a new, I'm learning um, a new shape, a new system, and it's all in French, it's really difficult. So, um, it's, we kind of get, when you have a new move, I have to learn that quickly, but I must translate in, in English in my head, and it's really, it's really difficult, but I am enjoying it. The boys are welcome me, and they help me a lot in the line and they love with me a lot, which is quite cool. It makes it a bit, uh, a bit easier. Um, and it's different than being home, you know, where we, you walk around, I can walk around in Paris, no problem, not saying I don't enjoy it, I, I don't enjoy it when I walk around at home. It's just different because nobody knows who I am and, you know, I go to dinner at the restaurant, I can sit and have a meal there, you know, with my kids and my family, no problem at all. But, yeah, of course I do miss home because um, it, where I come from and rugby is big everywhere in South Africa, you know, um, wherever you go. You know, because it means so much more than, than just the rugby game. Yeah, well, we're going to come back to you on that, Sid. Uh, Jack, just a little bit more around Ronan O'Gara, because he's been a phenomenon since he's been there. I know it's almost like the obvious thing to talk about. With, with an Irish legend there, I'm sure that we'll see Rog coaching Ireland one day, whenever that may be. Um, Andy Farrell's re-signed as an amazing coach, but how is he? The, the clips went viral of him saying it was, say, effing and norm or something last last season but he's really bought in hasn't he he just seems like a phenomenal coach and someone that really understands the game and the cultures around being in France as well yeah I think he I think he has I think obviously he's not he's not been far off from playing which uh considering how many years ago he was playing and he's already been New Zealand coaching obviously at Racing coaching now he's he's a head coach down and he's uh you know put two stars on the shirt for, for Stad Rochelet I think the, the beauty of it is the fact that he's not been far away from the game, so he still understands the players, he still understands what's needed. Um, so he can bring that side of it, and obviously he's brought the, uh, the, the, the generic, you know, the French way of not travelling and not playing on away games and stuff like that. He's completely changed that with the team, and, and obviously nowadays in rugby, you know, you've got to try and win every game, and, uh, you know, especially to become, you know, double European winners. Um, so yeah, he's unbelievable. He's straight talking, he's straight to the point, you know, where you stand with Roger, which is, uh, I think, the best way. 
Um, but yeah, like you said there, like just getting to know him, getting to know his family, seeing what he's like uh, with the team, he's, uh, he's certainly um, ready for the international stuff. Yeah, just sticking with that, see, on the coaches, so Jacques Enab is now at Leinster, and we all know the pedigree that he's brought, it'd be interesting to see. We are in, we're in Leinster land, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, so there's a map. Yeah, they're all here, all, all of them. Every Leinster fan's in the room tonight, but Sia, Sia, what's he going to add to this Leinster team? Like, what's he like as a coach, as a human being? How good is he that Leinster have got him? Um, I've known Jock since I was um, 18 years old, and um, he's coached me since he was 18, and obviously before he left um, to go to Ireland, and I think every time I've, I've seen him, you know, he's he's changed and he's grown, he, he, like he grows a lot as a coach, as we grow as players, but he grows with us as well, you know, he's, he gets to know you as a person, he knows me, he knows my whole family, he knows my whole life story, you know, so when he speaks to, to me, you know, when we play, I mean, Stephen will tell you, like on the field, or before the game, when he, how he gets you up, he speaks to you as a person, what you play for, what means a lot to you, and, and he gets you to go to places that a lot of people can't get you to go to, um, and all of it by telling you, about things about you, you know, that, that that he knows. And I really do enjoy that. It's not about go stuff the mouth, but everybody can say that, but he gets into it. Why do you play, you know, who we're playing for? And he's really good at that. And he's really amazing on detail too. You know, he, when he came in 2018 at the Spring he changed our defensive system. And I remember the first game, we, were, we actually played England and, and in, in um, Joburg. And the first 15 minutes, England scored 21 points because we were reading for the first time. And he told us, when they scored the third try, he's like, if you stop reading, you'll be getting, you'll be sub. Keep on making the mistake. It's okay, do it now. Gives you that kind of um, freedom as a player. And he just got better and better, you know. And, and that's the type of person he is. And he spends a lot of work with making the, the team better on the training field. So, yeah, he will be special for the guys. And he will be, he's also good, good on the human side as well. Because the big thing that I noticed for South Africa, what everyone was talking about, was the fact that the coaches and the relationship with the players and the respect between everyone, and everyone can say they can build this culture here and that people are happy to get subbed off, like Marnie Lebot gets subbed off in the semis. You were coming off early in some of the games, Evan yeah. and some of the higher profile names. We're going to talk about the bottom squad a little bit later and the kind of effect that they had on the games as well. But how is that as captain and, and when you're dealing with that and the understanding, how does it, you know, how do you get to that point of culture where you're confident yeah. that you're happy to come off at 50 minutes or Marnie's happy to come off in a yeah. he's not happy to come off, but he's comfortable enough not to be pissed off, visibly pissed off about yeah. it. It's, it's honestly when you get to a point where, you know, it starts from the from, from Rusty, you know, the, the director of rugby. He started it when he, when he was coach in 2018. Um, he kind of, like, you can ask Stephen, the first meeting we had, he spoke about how are we getting paid so much money but we keep on losing. You know, when, when in 2017 people were burning out this. But your salary keeps on going up every year, but your performance is not going up, you know. And you play badly, but you focus on the social media and you post something nice on social media there to treat people, to make them, you know, like, oh, but he's such a, they play badly, but he's such a good person. That already, and he told us, like, the stream of Jersey is more important than any of us uh, as players, because it will keep on going on, and there's been bigger players being there before us. And all we have to do is give everything to the Jersey, and everybody's dream of those will come through, you know? And that's when, you know, our mindset changed, you know, and, and we bought into the plan that he had, and also knowing that, like, Spremo represents something far bigger than all of us. It's in South Africa, what it did in 95 to how South Africa turned into the, 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 the new South Africa today. We, people look at us as still that same team in, in, like, 1995, but obviously it's changed now. It's more diverse, which represents South Africa a bit more. So, he tells you as well, when you tie, you will get sub because the next guy behind you is as good as you are, you know, but he's a better he's better than you when you're seventy percent if you study that. And like I've been sub as well. Like it's all about this. Sometimes the players they shouldn't put their hands up and say, Listen, I'm too tired now, I can't go anymore. That's where we had as a team because we trust each other so much and we understand if you force yourself, if you hurt a little bit or you're too tired and it's not about you know, where you wanna look good and wanna act strong. It's all about making sure that the best guy is on the field for the team. 
Yeah, and he told us to like let it go of our of egos and put it in first. That's why I never I knew when I was taking off. You kind of feel okay. I'm not as effective as like the quarterfinals and the semifinals. I wasn't so as as impactful as I was in the final. I was taking off early, and you know how happy I was to see because when Kwaka and everybody got this game one, it just changed the whole game. Because if I stayed on, there's no way I would have made the same impact as he did. And I was comfortable. Not that I'm happy to be sad. But I'm comfortable knowing that this guy's going to do something better than I can do. Well, if we're being honest, and if I'm being honest, I should have played 12 minutes in every game that I played. <laughs> <laughs> like, really. Yeah. If, if we're going to sit here and be honest. Uh, Jack, I know we haven't got you long. It's awesome that you guys have dialed in. So, big news. Um, I don't know how big it is here in Ireland, but with Andy Farrell and his relationship with his, well, his dad, you know, with Farrell, there's talk of him going over to Racing 92 to shout at Sia every time that he doesn't catch the ball. What, how do you think Owen will do? over in France, it's kind of big news, and see, I'm going to ask you about this just quickly as well. So, Owen Farrell to Racing 92, what, will, it, will it suit him? I think it will. I think, um, obviously, he's close with Lanny. Um, I know they had a good relationship when, when, when Lanny was over with, with, with us in England, and I know they've stayed pretty close uh, since he's been uh, doing different things. Um, but Owen's he's a past player, whether you like him, whether you don't, you, you can't take away from you know, how good he is on the field and how much of a leader he is um, going forward. So I, I think I think he'll be good there. If it's if it's a done deal, if it's not, I'm not too sure. See, I'm, I'm in the unknown like uh, a lot of people, but um, I, I think it'll be good for him. I think it'd be a shame to see him leave Saris in England, but you know, at the same time, after uh, experiencing this side of it and, and seeing what it's like to play rugby over here as well, it's, uh, it's a pretty awesome experience. Yeah, that's class. See, I'm not going to ask you about Owen, but I'm going to just let you know that I absolutely butchered the intro when we were talking about Wings for Life and why we're here. But that's why we've got you here, because you are the global ambassador. I've basically just told everyone in here, some people who weren't here, just to scan QR codes, right? That's what I'm trying to do. But there's a big event happening on May the 5th. I know that you're really passionate about being a Red Bull athlete and some of the initiatives that they're doing. Can you maybe just give us a couple of lines on how people can get involved? I'm hearing that you're going to be doing a couple of things as in where people can hear you motivate them on the way around. Um, sorry, sorry, I'm just, my, my kids just got out. My, my wife is not here, she's back in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, looking after, um, I'm looking after the kids. I'm so sorry See, that. I don't feel sorry for you now, I've got four, so I'm talking to those people. Just give them a forget. <laughs> Otherwise I'm going to have to go through, I'm going to have to talk about the QR code again. Don't let me do that. <laughs> No, it's, I think it's important. I think the the wins for life run. Um, I think, yeah, we 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 fortunate, man. We fortunate to be like for me to be able to do what I love and enjoy, you know, and enjoy it. You know, there are many people who some of them got injured and some of them just got hurt and were never able. You know, we we you basically running on. And I think it's on the fifth year. You know, you can run. You can run wherever you are. And um, it's to do more research to help, you know, people um, that can't walk, you know, to, to, to help them walk again, you know, people that want to run and do sports, it's people who love to be active. And there's nothing more how, um, um, amazing than that when you do something for someone you don't know, you never met before, but you know, to make a difference. And I think it's important, it's not only helping someone else, it's also healthy for you, you know, to be doing something like that, because you can walk or you can run, you can do anything, and it's all about, you know, it's, it's about what you can do. It's not competing against someone else, it's always you versus you. And I think that's really important. It's always, I always say this, you know, to do, like, you, it's always much better to, to do something for someone else. It gives you, it, it, people always think like charity work or doing something like this, it helps the other person. Nothing um, makes my heart more warm or more happy than me when I do something for someone else, you know. It actually helps me a, a little bit. It makes me feel more good than me achieving all these uh, things on the field, you know, because those things like trophies and medals and records, they'll all be broken. Someone else will come in and break that part. With the life that you touch, you know, it, it, it's always like a, a domino effect, I believe. It, so that person which will be inspired to touch someone else as well. Absolutely amazing. So that's the QR code to sign up for that, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah. Lads, thank you so much. You've added huge value to this evening. Jack Noll, Red Bull athlete. Sia Khaleesi, Red Bull athlete. And two absolute legends. Sia, I'm actually coming to Paris tomorrow to see you. So 
Uh, I am, I'm not just making that up. So I'm coming over to next week. So I'll see you. So, yeah, I'm coming over tomorrow though. Just want to get there nice and early. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, I'm not coming to La Rochelle. I'm not doing that. If my eyes are a bit red, as Stephen Kitsoff has got a glint in his eye, he wants to get loose in Dublin tonight. So. Is it? Is it? There he is. Look at there. There we go. There he is. <laughs> Well done with the hat, lads. We didn't plan that either. All three of us. Yeah, all on brand. Red Bull athletes. Right, we're going to let you go with the kids. See you, Jack. you've got a nanny there, so you're fine. But legends, give a round of applause for you. It worked. How the hell did that work? Hey. Who knows? Absolute legend. I mean, Jack Noel, having spent a bit of time with him as well. Go on, Matt, you go. You take the four. You know, I had notes for the questions, but um, I couldn't multi I couldn't, I didn't have, I, don't, I ain't got three. I was going to say three legs. Okay? No, I was, three I, was just gonna, I was just going to say, thanks for keeping on so long. Yeah, my neck's fat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I appreciate that. Bum shoulder and a bum neck. Well done, Jimmy. That's fine. That, it's, it's a great, as much as we love Jack, but it's great to see you, Khaleesi. You, you turn for, hey, if you don't turn for any, if you don't turn for C, you ain't turning for any man. But, um, Steve, as your captain, and he's a Red Bull athlete, he does all these different things to get some of his time tonight. Just where, well, his story and stuff like that, I don't expect to go through that, but just give us a kind of insight into what he's like as a captain. Yeah, I think, um, what you saw there is, like, he's so passionate about charity and, um, almost giving himself for, for the greater good, so um, I think he's summed him up himself pretty well there and uh, yeah, I think he's a, a major global ambassador for, for wellness and, and, and giving, caring about people, so no, he's just an absolute legend of a person. Yeah, he absolutely is. So, you, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, there's a part two to this, you know, yeah, I know, <laughs> I know, and uh, we've got a couple of other special guests here, one that we might invite up as well. Is Greg O'Shea here? I heard, I heard he's in the room, so yeah. where is he? Where are you, Greg? In the nose, please, Jim. That a boy, mate, humble. You stay up there, mate. Nice and neat. That's where we like you. He was late as well, actually, Jim. That's why he's in the nose, please. Exactly. And um, Matt, right because now. you're a Red Bull athlete oh. as well, can you just tell everyone what they need to do during the, what they call it, intermission? Is that what they say in theatres? Um, so 15 minutes, so they can go to the bar, they can top up their drinks. There's an array of drinks. There's gin, there's whiskey. Yeah, you can help it. What else, sir? What else do they need to do? I'll tell you what they need to do. Yeah, they need to scan the QR codes. Right. I don't know. You didn't tell me this. I've, I've told them about 20 times. They need to scan the QR codes. Oh, so yeah, there's some lovely people talking about times. So if you're, if you're having issues, there's some lovely people floating about that can show you what to do. We're going to be back for part two. We're here till, well, till, till, till it closes. So we'll see you then. Enjoy the bowl. We'll back in about 15, 20 minutes. Thanks. be honest. Yes. Did you use a QR code? Yes. Absolutely. I don't know why I've got an iPad. I've not even looked at it once. In a bit. It's got all the notes in about the QR code. Anyway, just chatting to Greg O'Shea backstage. Greg, where are you? He's doing the shit since you've been forward. He's got um, a new partner, haven't you? I do, yes. South Africa. Smart. World yeah. champion. I see what you've done there. Greg, great to have you here as well. We've got another guest. I was going to... I said we've got two great guests in the room. So we tried to get Johnny Sexton, he didn't want to come, he didn't want to know, nothing to do with it. We did, in my opinion, better than that. So one of the greatest guys, friend of the show, he's one of the best guys in the media. I'm talking you up here, Bernard Chapman. Come up on stage, please, if you will. There you go. I just want to be sitting that one there. I had a much better intro for you, Bernard, when you came up on... Stephen? Bernard? Stephen? Bernard? You? <laughs> You fucking retire. <laughs> Steve, you not see us? I was afraid to say it in the green room. Basically, I'm 18 years older than uh, Stephen, and uh, when I had hair, I had a big mop of red hair, right? So every time he plays a match on TV, my fucking phone lights up. Jack Man's your son. It's your son. <laughs> You've got history in South Africa, though. I mean, you, just, you were slagging him. You were slagging him about being um, being pale and, and not liking the sun, but. Uh, I got my first tour for Ireland in, uh, I went my first tour for Ireland in 1998, uh, Warren Gatland 
uh, was the coach, and then um, it was an old-fashioned tour, six weeks. And um, actually, I'll, I'll tell a long story. But um, in, in those days, so Stephen just told us uh, at the World Cup they had their families rooming, their wife rooming, and girlfriends. It was a real family atmosphere. In those days, it was six weeks of debauchery, right? So we were gone, right? I was I was 19 years of age, um, and it was an old-fashioned tour. I said six weeks, lots of drinking, good fun. And um, when you go on tour, your roommate is absolutely key, right? So whoever you're with that week is, is going to make or break your, 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 your tour, your week. And then, so anyway, two of the legends on that tour were Mick Galway and a fellow called Peter Claus, he called it Claw, right? So they were my heroes. They were 32 or 3 men of the world. And then, so anyway, we, we drove in. Monster! Monster, is that yeah. He just said Monster, just in case you didn't know. So you just, uh, so, so we drove into we drove into Cape, uh, the, the Holiday Inn at Newlands uh, in Cape Town, and uh, I didn't know this, but the team manager used to ring the hotel ahead and ask them to fax through the room plan. Right, this is how old it was. We were faxing through the room plan, and he basically find the two rooms furthest apart and say, right, okay, that's perfect. So anyway, he gets up, he names the room and list, and it's room 101, Eric Elwood, and someone else. Anyway, I was room 103, Mick Galway. Right, so I was like. Yes, 19 years of age, I'm gonna be a man by the end of this week, right? So, anyway, I was, I was so young, my mum had packed my bags, right? So, we, we get into the room and uh, Mick Galway just fires his bag into the corner, whips off his uh, tracksuit into his boxer shorts, jumps on the bed, gets the remote control. He's the alpha male, right? I'm gonna be watching Mick Galway's TV for the week, right? I, I was hanging up my shirts, right? Putting my box of shorts in one drawer, my socks in the other, etc. And he was just laughing away at me. So about 15 minutes later, I'd unpack my bags. I was just about to jump on the bed to watch TV. And I saw the door was on the latch. Uh, locked. It was unlocked. I said, Mick, will I lock the door? And he goes, ah, no, it would be grand. Or whatever, carry man, right? So, and I, I jumped onto the bed. So five minutes later, boom, right? The door's kicked in. I rise Peter Kloss, he was two bags, right? He gets his room key, throws it on the bed, and he goes, fuck off, Jack Ben, right? So, 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 the point, the, the poor team manager, team manager thought he was keeping Mick Galway and Peter Clossy apart for six weeks, right? But he actually ended up out on, on the beer or whatever, right? But anyway, I go to my new room, which is room six fucking ninety four, right? And I had to do the walk of shame, right? First time in my life, whatever. <laughs> walk of shame. I tell you, I packed my bags a lot quicker than I unpacked them, right? So up to my room and he knocked on the door, who was a room with Trevor Brennan, right? The Barn Hall the the Barn Hall Milkman, right? So um and actually just you, you have great guests, Sia Khaleesi, Jack Mel, Mac Hansen, um, Stephen, World Cup, Double Good World Cup winner. I did a gig a couple weeks ago with, with Trevor Brennan and I went on to Wikipedia to see how I would introduce him, right? And like, you can talk about these lads for ages. Trevor Brennan's introduction for me was um, won a, a top 14 with, with Toulouse, uh, 39 yellow cards, <laughs> 11 red cards, and a life ban. Okay, so, um, so anyway. Friend of Ulster, actually, good friend. Of, yeah, say so your friend to Trevor Brennan in Ulster, go down well. Um, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, I room with Trevor Brennan, right? And uh, next day we have our first team meeting, and Warren Gatlin gets up and he's giving a, giving a talk about the importance of the tour, the opportunity to potentially win a test in South Africa, etc. And um, then he says, look, whenever I played for Waikato or, or New Zealand, and we played against an Irish team, um, or a Welsh team, or a Scottish team, or an English team, we used to laugh at how white and pasty and not athletic you were, right? <laughs> so we're going to try an experiment. So we had this bottle anyway, and um, there was no structures on it. And he said, this is fake tan. He said, Jackman and Brennan, you're the two palest. All right, we're going to try this tonight, right? So, so anyway, like, I was 19, I would have done anything. Trevor Brennan would jump off a five-story building if Warren Gatlin said, it's going to help your cause. So up to, up to the bedroom anyway, and um, I thought we'd just do our forearms and our quads and our hamstrings, right? Because in rugby you wear your socks up and, and you have uh, short sleeves. And Trevor goes, no, no, we're going to camp space swimming on Thursday, right? He goes, you have to do the full body, right? So, so anyway, so down to our boxer shorts. He's putting it on my back, I'm putting it on him. Um, get my own chest and belly, to be fair, right? And uh, anyway. I know a lot more about fake tan now because of a 17 year old daughter, right? But back in 1998, it was fucking primitive, right? So, um, uh, nothing happened, right? So Trevor goes, fuck's sake, you put another layer on, right? So, um, so anyway, here we go again, we put another layer on, right? And uh, of course, nothing happened, right? And Trevor goes, one more for luck, right? So, um, so all I remember is waking up at 6 o'clock in the morning, right? 
and it was like, it was like I had an accident in the bed, right? And, and, and I shouted at Trevor, and all I could see were the whites of his eyes. Right? So he pointed at me, whatever, I pointed at him. Into the shower together. Right? Okay. Uh, it sounds are homoerotic, it wasn't, right? Okay. I'm trying to get a fucking thing off, right? But it doesn't come off, okay? It doesn't come off, whatever. So, um, I can see why you're, you're up in Ulster in the, in the red, in the wet and rain. So, um, that, that's, my, that's my experience of Warren Gatlin, the prick. Go to gentlemen. Genuinely one of the best in the business, and we're going to talk a little bit more. I know you, Steve, you were lost when he said room 103, which is 103, just so you know. 103, I think it is. Um, Matt, you're in the new age of athletes, right, where the social media, luckily for me and Bernard Jackman, there wasn't, it was a fax machine back then. You know, by the time we got there, it was all lies anyway. So in this Irish club, we were talking a little bit back, back and forth, and this isn't going out now live. We're thinking about putting live, we're going to get a little bit looser now. But in the squad, who are the top lads? I was going to ask you to grade them out of 10, so if it does get tumbleweeds, I'll basically say, like, Caelan Doris, as a lad, 10 being the best lad, 1 being, like, a James Lowe, I'm, I'm, I know James, I'm joking, I like him, I like James Lowe, but who are the, the, the good lads in there? Like, who are the Trevor Brennans, the loosest? Caelan Doris, what's he like? Uh, yeah, Bogsy's kind of, that's his nickname in case anybody's wondering. Um, I learned it's because he's from the Bogs of Mayo or something like that, so Bogsy. Um, he's, you know, he's, he's a solid nine. He's, he's kind of stepped up in, um, in, the, in the past year. He's really come into himself. And why is that? Well, what's been the change in his circumstances to make, make him step up? I say that, as in, I, I don't know Caleb Dallas apart from following each other on social media. Next thing, like with video calling, he's in Vegas at these tables with these establishments. It must have been like a, a gymnastic event or something. <laughs> He's video me and there's lots of likes and stuff like that. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna come with it, that's Bogsy's fucking, that's his business, not mine. No, so that's what I mean. So now we've got that gigs up to him, alright? Yeah, I'm just thinking, he's a 10 out of 10 player, and now because he's into gymnastics and athletes and stuff like that in Vegas, I'm thinking, like, is he a bit loose, is he? Old Caleb, the old Doris. Yeah, yeah, no, he's loose in a good way. I, the, the loosest by far is, is definitely Dave Kilcoyne, though. If um, <laughs> anybody knows any stories about him, Please keep it to yourself because it will end his career. He's, the, thing, like, the things that he's gotten away with over the years, you hear a new story about him every single day and you're like, that actually has to be made up, surely? Like, you just can't get just away with it. one, if you lose I honestly life. cannot tell you any story about him. He's, he's an absolute fucking lunatic. Um, he'd say he's a 10 out of 10 bloke. Uh, and, you know, so I, th I thought, um, his nickname's Killer. I thought Killer was... 29. Killer's like 35, and he's still going on holidays with like 18 year olds and stuff like that. Um, so he, he's great, man. He's great. He, he's the leader of the crack in, in the squad by far. Uh, he's, uh, you know, he's gonna live forever, I'd say. Someone who looks anti crack, and I can say it here because of the red and the blues, and he's a red. Um, Peter Omani in the garden, like, surely he, that's anti crack, in my opinion. Like, I like fruit, I like looking at plants, but I don't get down on my hands and knees. <laughs> That ain't rock and roll. That is not gymnastics in Vegas, like Caleb and the old Doris. Like, they must be clashing. You know what I mean? Do they sit next to each other and say, right, I, how's the guard then? How's Vegas? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, oh, look at that. You said it all. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put Pete, you on the spot Pete, here. Uh, no, we don't have anybody in the team that's not, that's not good crack. And Pete, he might seem like a real grumpy prick. He is, don't get me wrong. But, <laughs> Uh, no, Pete has a very good time, just like anybody else. Uh, once you get him, once you get him going, he's hard to stop. Peter Romani, he loses all control of his body and like his work. I can't understand a word that he's saying towards the end of the night. He's just, it's a lot of like mm, and stuff like that. So, um, no, he, Pete's, Pete's well, We saw, didn't we? And, and, and again, social media is the death of people, but also the heaven. It's not heaven and hell. But after the All Blacks, the series win down there, he's giving yeah. chicken wings. Off random people. Was it him or Bundyaki? I mean, let's not talk about Bundyaki because he seems pretty loose. Is he pretty yes. loose? Let's talk about Bundyaki. How loose is he? <laughs> uh, uh, I think, you know, he's he's calmed down a little bit now because, you know, he's obviously father of. Um, father of four. Twelve. Uh, four, yeah. <laughs> I, actually, I was going to make that joke and I was like, no, I won't. That would be inappropriate. Uh, so, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> 
about this movie, we found Matt Hansen's niche. Just talking about who are the good lads in the squad. I like this. But on that as well, I'm, I'm, because part of it is like Andy Farrell, and we had uh, Lee Radford, who's coaching Northampton, on the podcast that I do with Goody. And this kind of northern rugby league background, but maybe cut from, I'm going to say, Arkoff, but more the old school, the faxing days, the Trevor Brennan days. Andy Farrell seems like he's cut from that cloth. And when I say that, is he kind of branches the professional game and the amateur game, understands the need to go out and let your hair down and have that and the professionalism. Like Andy Farrell's like that as a bloke. What's he like? What would you give him out of 10? So if Caelan's a 10... Of... I think everybody in the squad's a 10. I'm a nice guy. I'll give everybody a 10. Um... Yeah, you haven't been out the piss with us. It's, it's great, man. Um... I uh, know. Even James Lowe. We've seen... Do you give James Lowe a uh, Okay, I won't give James Lowe. <laughs> uh, he's anti crap. Yeah. Uh, no, Faz, Faz is good fun as well. All the coaches, um, when it's time to let their hair down, a lot of them don't have much hair anymore, but they 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 they, uh, they tend to have a good time. I'm trying to choose my words pretty carefully. That's stress. Well. You see, I understand that. But you, I mean, Andy Farrell, talking of tattoos, we were speaking about them earlier. But you love him that much that you've got his face tattooed yeah. on the side of your leg. Yeah. So maybe just kind of give us an idea of how that went down. I mean, a good reason is for winning the Grand Slam, right? Yeah, so, yeah, I just kind of said it as a joke because I have my housemates. Um, so I've got him tattooed on my other leg. Um, and that's What's story, his name? That story came about because it was literally, I was getting a couple of tattoos and my housemate was like, well, what are you going to get my face? And I was like, I actually would if you pay for it. And it was a bit of a game of chicken and then booked it in. I remember went into the tattoo parlour and um, I give the photo to the tattoo artist. He's like, oh, um, he's just like your friend that's passed away. And I was like, no, he's just right behind me. <laughs> <laughs> he's painful, um, uh, And then, so it became a bit of a running joke. Oh, if we win the Grand Slam, we'll, we get Faz. Um, like, yeah, yeah, righto, whatever at the start of the um, tournament and kind of forgot about it and then it got to like the last week and Johnny was like, you still get that tattoo if we, uh, if we win, right? And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, of course, absolutely. <laughs> um, obviously we won and I've been a man of my word. I thought, what better way to do it? Um, I remember when we told Faz, Johnny goes, um, oh, Max's going to get your face if we win this Grand Slam. And he's like, oh, right, is he? Yeah, right. <laughs> That's all about it. Um, but then when I sent it to him, sent him the photo, and I go, man, my word, um, the fucking, the bastard opened it and didn't reply for about an hour. <laughs> so I literally sit there sweating, like, going, I'm literally never going to play again. Um, and then he finally called me, he's like, man, I love it, I love it. Man. This looks great, it wouldn't be cool to camp if you didn't get it. Um, it was he's from India, by the way. He's from India. He's from India, man, you found out. Um, just as we get that, just, just as Bernard's going to chat there, can you, we maybe Google or go on Max's Instagram just so people can see it as we're, uh, as we're talking, we can pull it up. There we go. That's what Rogan does, doesn't he? He gets the guy to pull up stuff. Oh, this is doing it. Sorry, go on. No, just the Yoshin Downing one, the Andy Farrell one, the Jim Hamilton one, the, the best. But did you get Peter Dooley's dad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were actually, we were playing... We were playing Newcastle. We were yeah playing Newcastle Challenge Cup last year, and um, we all call Peter Dooley his dad's name, Jerry Dooley. I don't know why, just yeah, cut from the same cloth. And somebody's like, you should get Jerry Dooley under there, so it looks like that's Jerry Dooley. And I thought that was a fantastic idea, and um, yeah, got it the day before the game. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, I'd say actually, the coaches. I don't know if they know that. I didn't actually do that. Yeah. So, like, it's about, a great story though. But well, as you can see on here, the tattoos, I've got some absolutely horrendous ones. So as we find the tattoo of Andy Farrell, so let me just tell you a couple of stories about mine. So back in the day, I got my first big contract at Leicester, £5,200 a year. So I treated my now wife to a lovely holiday, the first holiday. But we used to go down to Bournemouth, which is just south of in England, but I took her to Egypt on this unbelievable holiday. So she was absolutely crazy. Worst weather there's ever been. There was like a, a sandstorm or whatever. Oh, here we go. Here's the tap. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, it looks like a, a, a cake. It looks like a. I don't even know what that is. 
Oh, 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 And you know the worst thing is, Faz has now grown his hair out and cut his beard. So. <laughs> <laughs> looks nothing like him. Hey, you grow into it. I think, I think it looks okay. I'd give that a solid 4 out of 10, which for a tattoo. You don't know how hard it was to find a photo of him smiling first of all. Yeah. That's why it probably doesn't look like him. I know, but this is what I mean. Like, you see someone like, so I, got, I took my wife to Egypt, like she was loving life. There was a big sandstorm when we were there, so I thought, I'll tell you what, let's go on a couple of excursions. So I grew up in Coventry, which is just north of, north of Scotland, I don't know if anyone knows, just north of the Hebrides. <laughs> and uh, shit hole, shit hole, effectively. So we've gone to Egypt on this budget holiday. Couldn't be at the resort because it's like a sandstorm anywhere. So I thought, I'll tell you what, let's go to an excursion. So we end up, ended up going to Jerusalem, not on camels, like we actually had to like, get on a bus and go there. And what do you do in Jerusalem? Get a tattoo. Of course you do. Straight into a tattoo shop. And obviously the guy didn't speak Scottish or English. And so I'm writing down what I want to get, and I get this Arabic kind of transcript. I saw David Beckham again, I thought, awesome. So I wrote J A M E S. James, right? So I wrote my name, it's uh, my birth name, my father's name, my grandfather's name as well. Got it tattooed on the inside of my arm, in there, absolutely loving it. So my first tattoo, so walking around like that. Fast forward, Saracens ended up going there, so they washed a load of money, were overpaying people, went to Dubai, didn't I? Okay, free holiday. And I'm lying on the beach, right, like that, loving life, got the kids down, and they're bringing everything to you, like pineapples, like Fiji water, and every time that this guy keeps coming over, he keeps going, Samaj, Samaj. And I've got no idea what he's fucking saying. Like this. And he says it on the last day. I'm like, mate, hey, what's going on here? Like, what, what he said, he said, oh, Samaj, your tattoo says a Samaj. I said, no, no, no. He says, it says uh, James. He says, no, he says, it's Arabic, it goes backwards. It says uh, Samaj. Absolute. <laughs> Disgrace. And it's in Arabic. I also, I also got Superman tattooed on my arm at 24, which looked fucking sick. Imagine having Superman tattooed on your arm at 41. <laughs> fucking absolutely embarrassing. Um, Stephen, some of the lads in the South Africa squad, I know the culture's very different there. Ah, uh, there's some big characters, I mean, there's some big men, but they seem like quite quiet, like you see Evan Elizabeth going around grabbing people with his eyes hanging out of his head and stuff like that. But what's, what's he as a lad? I mean, because a lot of them are from kind of farming backgrounds, uh, religion's a big thing. Basically, just hit us with a couple of the loose fuckers that are in the squad. <laughs> Jesse Creel looks loose. Um, yeah, so, so probably with Gibbon, like, Everyone always sees like the, the raging monster on the rugby field, but um, when it comes to, to getting on the piss, and um, he's probably the first guy to open up a bottle of brandy and just you. finish it within two hours. So he's, the boys. Yeah, he's, he's good, good on the crack, and um, I'll probably say the loosest cannon is probably Quaha, like, or Quaha or RG. So as soon as the beers start flowing, you can expect the teacher to be ripped off your body and... <laughs> Imagine RG Simon ripping your teeth, you'd be like, just take it. Yeah. Take the fucking trousers as well. Like, what have you so we, were, we were playing a game um, um, in Cardiff, so, and we had a, it was the last game of the, the what you call the summer series, and um, just having a massive piss up, and Ludi Ocha bought his brand new pair of um, G Star jeans, like brand new, what's it like? South Africa, they're a fortune, by the way. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a fortune. And um, so he's sitting there, minding his own business, and uh, Yemen and RG look at him and stuck. Like, I reckon we can rip those jeans right off his body. <laughs> so they start pulling on him, and Lewis fighting back, and he's just pushing him, and they grip him, and they pull it straight off his body. The only thing remaining is the belt in his t-shirt. So, uh, <laughs> now we like need to get Back to the room, he's like, he phones concierge, like, please can you bring a towel to the, to the team room? I need to get back to my room so I can go change. It's like, well, so what happened? No, my jeans got ripped off me. Oh, hey, I feel for him. You know, it's like when you're six foot ten, people are expecting to see something that actually isn't there. I know, genuinely, genuinely. Quarter Chinese, I am, which I am. And they ask me which part. I don't know how loose we can go here. Try to keep it fun. Um, Bernard. Let's get into a little bit of detail. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say again, one of the best in the business, as in looking for information, come to you. You've been on the podcast as well. It was one of the ones that was 
well received as well. If we were to look at things now, we were talking about the World Cup and we were talking about how amazing it would be if Ireland won the World Cup. But I genuinely think that I love that South Africa won it, but I just think if Ireland, the size of the country, just with everything that's going on in Ireland at the minute. So I just want to talk a little bit about that and also how the team are now in transition. Transition means something very different now, so we've got to be very careful. So <laughs> they're a team that are in transition. Let's keep it calm. So they're a team that are in transition. So let me start on this, okay? Who's the next 10? For Ireland, this is the million dollar question, yeah. right? And there's a load of different people like Pen Prentagast, and you were talking about him on the podcast about how good he is. Billy Burns was brilliant at the weekend. He's not really had a look in. The Burns, like Kieran Frawley, I know there's a couple of names out there as well. This is what I, I want you yeah. to... Who was the other one? Well, I, I think Crowley. Crowley. I, I'm, yeah, shocked Crowley. If, I'm, I'm shocked if shocked Jack Crowley isn't the starting 10 for Ireland against France. Um, he's come back for the World Cup. Um, and he's played a lot of games for Munster and he's been good. He's been good in a Munster team that has struggled. Uh, the problem for Andy Farrell is that in Leinster no one's got consistent game time. So Harry Burns played a couple of games, Sam Prendergast played a couple of games, Ross Burns has been injured. Um, then up in Ulster, Billy obviously had a brilliant game last week uh, against Leinster, but is he going to bring him back? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, I think, I think Jack Crowley would certainly start. I think Frawley would be on the bench. Um, because he can cover 12, 13, 15 and 10 um, but I, I think we're waiting for Ross Byrne to come back to start to see can he push Jack Crowley or if one of those youngsters is going to come through. The problem for all those players is they have so many 10s even without Johnny that none of them are getting their running games um, which is actually hampering um, Ireland. I think there's a chance that Nathan Doak who's now a 9 may end up playing 10 as a, with a view to, not for Six Nations, but there's a, a chance that they're going to look at him as a 10 long term um, to be an Ulster 10 and maybe then be an Irish 10 goal kicker. Has played a lot of games already for a guy of his age, really good temperament. So yeah, he could be a, a bolter because and all, unless one of the Leinster 10s move, it's going to be very difficult for them to, to get that number one spot. Uh, so yeah, we're in a bit of a, with Jack Crowley who hasn't, he's not proven, proven like a fire or a sexton or a bigger, um, but we think he has the raw materials. But behind that, it's, uh, it's really unclear who's the next man. And Johnny's legacy and lasting so long and playing so many games, has, and obviously Joey was behind him, he's, he's had injuries. It's just no one has been able to step up to, to be a clear number two, bar Jack Crowley, and then number three is not clear either. Because that, and that is the thing, like you can't even name who you think it should be. And that's the thing around the World Cup, right? Ireland went all in on Johnny. And I don't know, we've not spoken about this. You spent a bit of time with, with Johnny in Dubai. Like, looking at that quarterfinal, and I'm, I'm going to be a little bit harsh here. I'm a massive Johnny Sexton fan, even though I said he should have retired six years ago. I <laughs> actually said that. I oh, Johnny's got a loose streak in it. Yeah, but obviously you don't see it very often, or luckily. Um, but you, you found out, so that, that stare he gave you, I mean, um, falling out with Johnny Sexton is like falling out with your wife. You're in trouble for what you did this morning, but he brings up something you did fucking two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's, a, he's a memory, an unbelievable memory. I, I disagree. I think a lot of people said, oh, he should be off the field. But the problem is he's so dominant uh, and is so good that I think we all felt he was going to... I know he looked tired, but I certainly felt he was going to pull a pass or you know, find, a, find an option to break them down, uh, because that's what he's kind of always done. So I can see why he was on the field. I mean, and, and it, in some way for me, it's fitting that he finished, even though obviously he wanted to finish further on, but he finished on the field, trying to find a way to unlock an, an all backs defence who didn't want to break. So when you look at it now, and you look forward to the Six Nations, a team that have won the Grand Slam, they've been world number one, they're struggling to find a 10, they've now lost another one of their stars, Red Bull athlete, Matt Hansen, if you didn't know that was. Um, how do they approach the Six Nations? Because some people will say, well, they need to start, they need to double down on a Jack Crowley, regardless if it goes well or it doesn't go well. They need to test different players. They need to look at different combinations. You know, does someone like Peter Omani carry on? Do they... Do you know what I mean? Like, because they are a team, they, they've done it, they've won the grants, and this is the conversation which is asking a player is really hard to talk about, right? Because you want to win the Grand Slam again, you want to win, but if the World Cup in four years' time is the incentive, 
And it's so difficult, isn't it, being in the World Cup? You put all your eggs in that basket and you come away with nothing. And then if you're one of the top teams, you come away with nothing. So how does Andy Farrell, having re-signed a deal, how, how do you think he approaches it? I think we're very lucky, Mac being injured, James Lowe hasn't played, he's come back this week, I think, or hopefully come back. Jimmy O'Brien is injured, Johnny's gone, Conor Murray hasn't really been playing very much or playing a form. What do you want to do with Pete? Pete's been injured. So there is an opportunity to transition, we need to find a new captain. Um, and that's going to, there's no obvious candidate. You go with someone like Gary Ringrose, maybe someone like Caelan Doris, um, James Ryan. Uh, so there's a lot of teams <laughs> back at him. When you get back, when you get back, when you get back, when you get back. So you can't be captain. Uh, you can be captain, yeah, you can. After he goes back. Definitely. Definitely. Mate, about captain of morale. Mate, captain of morale. That's a great, I was that. I was vice captain of morale, basically. <laughs> Which means you're sh you don't want that. Shit player, but good bloke. You don't want that. You know, you'd rather be the young... That's, that sounds like the perfect career, really. You get, you get through a, a really good career by being just a good bloke. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. What do they do then, Bernard? Like, what? So what? I think fans will be pretty steady. But summer tour to South Africa. We've got England and France away. France away first. That looks very, very tough game. Um, Ireland have always been about win Six Nations, do the best you can, never really go Tate or, or blood players in that. Um, there is good talent in, in Irish rugby, a lot of very good talent at 19, 20. You might question the cycles above that. Um, so yeah, but Faz has got a real life of talent. You know, he played James Lowe when, you know, wasn't sure, Jim, Jimson Gibson Bar, Parks, Mac came in, you know, pretty early, and he's given people who had the, the ability, the chance, and they've all proven to be shrewd choices. So I do reckon he'll find some of the talent out there that maybe we've missed uh, and, and bring them through. And, and the culture and the coaching staff are, are top end, so they'll get the best out of them. But I don't know if we'll win the Six Nations this year, but we, we'll be there in our best. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, when you look at the Six Nations, I know there's whispers, and sorry for all the traditionalists in the room, that South Africa would be keen. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it, if you think about the time zones and you think about the URC and the Champions Cup now, inevitability around it. But as a South African, when you look at these home nations, who do you rate the most? Who do you think are the best teams in there? Um, Ireland will obviously are off the back of the World Cup. Is there anyone else that you, like England, they always go well? Scotland, we beat in the World Cup. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, to be honest, like, Ireland's always been one of my favourite teams to watch in, in the Six Nations and um, I think France is also quite a strong team if you look at them uh, top 14 wise how, how well their teams are actually performing at the moment but still like Ireland's probably my number one and my favourite for, for the Grand Slam Smart from Belfast from Ulster so you win the crowd just tell me a little bit on any differences you've seen. So Dan McFarlane, I, I, I read it or something popped up somewhere about how you've come into the Ulster team. A team that, let's be honest, like we've spoken about it, a very good team, but haven't won much in recent years. And there's an expectation for them to do something. When they do do something, and I say do something, get to the business end of the season and start winning things, they'll potentially see more of the Ulster players because they're winning at the highest level, playing for Ireland. Have you, what have you noticed when you've come in there? Any differences in culture? in athleticism compared to the freaks of nature that you are in South Africa. Like what's the difference? Because when you think about it, you talk about double world champions versus a team, and this is no disrespect with a team that wants to be at that level. Have you noticed anything that where there's a difference yeah, in that I think, space? I think probably one of the biggest things like from club to club like that I've noticed is the amount of like professionalism and work that goes into like your daily schedule. Like um, like back home, like when when they put out a gym session, they just go like, "Here's a piece of paper and carry on, like do what you want to do." Um, and yes, like drilled out minute for minute what what you have to do. So I think the amount of work and detail that goes into a week's planning, um, how well the session is thought out, like the amount of work you do in a session and the type of detail stuff you do in a session is is exceptional. It's something I'm not used to, but um, I think that. I get a real feeling at, at also like the, the guys are really driven to do well, to try and win trophies. And I mean, like, when I spoke to Dan the first time, he said like, we made it into a semi-final, like the first URC uh, fell out in the quarter-final, second one. Like the team's got the ability to make it all the way, but like 
it's just finding that that edge and that competitiveness to actually just push it over, like just get it. It's on that knife edge at the moment, and we start to find a bit of form. But it's how can we go all the way? How can we play maybe a, a, a Bulls or Stormers in the final and actually get that victory? She showed against Leinster, which I don't think many people saw coming. If you look at the lay of the land in the league, you look at the profile of the two teams, the history between the two teams, massive win. What was the build up to that like? Yeah, I think it's just like building up to that, that Leinster game, which is like, there's so much hype around it. And like, I must give like, Ian Anderson is a lot of credit for this. Like, the way he actually kept the guys calm in the week building up and with these high profile games there's always a lot of energy it can either go chaotic or like controlled focused energy into into the prep and into the into the game itself so he did an exceptional role with him and 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 roddy and um and dan did exceptional job in the week to like channel that energy into a good performance um and then where like a guy like billy played a massive role like with executing on the plan for the for the night and we just like on analysis we picked up certain things that they do defensively and we just targeted that and uh, came away with a couple of quick tries early in the game and just held on to that lead so um yeah i think the, the detail and the prep is there it's just pushing it like keep pushing towards getting that victory we always have hot starts but tend to fade away a bit in the back end of the game and it's almost just trying to keep the focus and trying to go all the way yeah and Matt, with Connor, we were talking about this. What did I call you? The underdogs. You didn't like that, did you? But I think... Yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to the podcast. You weren't happy with that. You weren't happy with the underdogs. <laughs> okay. If you're wondering what podcast it was, it's the Bidgeon Show. Just to do with a few more horrible comments to keep yeah. the algorithm going. But I like, I, I'm just going to say one other thing. Any Connor fans in the room? Yeah? 10,000. Thank you for being there. But... It is an obvious thing to say, mate. You look at it and the loyalty that yourself, like Bundyaki, has shown fantastic brand of rugby. But it is difficult when you look at the budgets, like Aki Snyman is going from red to blue. We were talking about the budget for, I've said his name wrong, how do you say it? RG. RG. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. fucker. It is RG. But how is it at Connor? Maybe just share that in the room here for the 10,000 fans that are in here from Connor. Um. Yeah, I th I think when it when it comes to finals like last last year when we beat Ulster in that final like it was everyone, everyone actually think, seems to forget that that we finished third and they finished fourth but out of all their responses but like I think when it comes to finals times and stuff like that it is um, Stephen was saying like it's it's just finding that extra that little bit extra it's um, and for us it was um, I remember that game especially it was. We were we had no chance. We were written off, and we wanted to show that we're you know good enough to be there. And um, on the day, it, it was just it was good enough to get us over the line. I feel like um, yeah, I don't know what they their thoughts were going into that game, um, but I think you just got to find that thing. And, and I actually think that it can maybe be a little bit hard, uh, a little bit harder when you're at, sort of at the top to find those sort of reasons. Um, I don't know what it was at the Stormers. The Stormers always seem to find them. Um, and then leading into that, you know, you could say that Munster had the same thing that we kind of went in expecting to do no good. But, you know, they had 100% belief in, in what they could do. So that's what I kind of think it comes down to once you get into finals times. For that, you can execute plans and you can, um, you know, you can try work things out that way. But then once you get there, you just gotta you just got to find that little bit extra to, to whatever that is. Yeah. I'll just say, so <clears throat> Mac, bleary-eyed as he is, has came off the operating table a few hours ago and he's had no sleep and that's the commitment to the cause to be for you millions of people in the room tonight. I'm looking at his eyeballs running out there. There you go. Win for life, baby. Win for life. So I'm going to come out and I'm going to come out into the, the masses and there's so many people in here, but if there's any questions you put your hand up now. If anyone's got a burning one at the end of the tunnel, I can come out and we can do it all. We can. Yes, sir. Jim, I'm going to act on. Before you go, go on. So, you're always trying to find out who are the loosest players. I did a bit of research on you. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I'm going to sit down on this. So, Jordan Murphy uh, played for Ireland when school. So, I rang him, I rang him uh, a couple of days ago to say, what was Jim like as a, as a youngster? So, Jim played, started in Leicester. And Leicester back then, old school. 
Wild. Yeah. Big yeah. pack. Yeah. Lots of booze and cigarettes. Yeah. Cigarettes. Blah, blah. <laughs> what was the, the name of the nightclub in Leicester? Zanzibar. Zanzibar, right? So <laughs> apparently they all go to Zanzibar and big lads, whatever. And uh, next thing you'd see people running from the dance floor, right? Like girls screaming, fellas <laughs> running, whatever, right? And bouncers would be saying, Red alert, red alert, red alert, right? So all the bouncers would go flying towards the, the dance floor to see what was happening. Jim would have gone into the cleaning um, the press, right? Got the piss buckets and the, and the mop, whatever, right? And he was just on the middle of the dance floor, just fucking swinging. <laughs> I come from humble beginnings, so I was playing. So I said to Jordan, was there a big fight? And he, and he goes, no, no. The bouncers aren't going to start a fight in a six foot ten, eight, plug in, but all the rest of them. Just waiting from time to time out. <laughs> I'm so glad the stories could have been a lot worse. So good. Yeah, the clean version. Yeah, that, it, well, I mean, that was the clean version as well. So I've got a question in the front row. Where are you? It's not many questions, it's more of a ask. Okay, that's fine. Sorry, sir, what's your name? Where are you from? Jack. Jack, I'm from Dublin. Accountant, I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> So much so, my girlfriend, uh, her nephew is named Mac as well, and I promised her I'd get a picture with Mac. Okay, well we can make that happen. We can make that happen. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. So the question is, I'll ask the question. Mac, can we have a, a picture? Get up! Get up! Have you scanned the QR code? I have. Yeah, I've scanned. Just do. Just do all of that, that's fine. We'll, yeah, we'll do it pictures as well. I've got another question back here. You can do that bit weird, but it's fine. As you can talk, isn't it? Oh, we've got loads of questions. We'll just get a question, we'll just get a picture there. Hang on, let's just watch this. This bit awkward. All right. Mac, put your arm around him. There we go. Hello, boy. It's Mac Hansen there. There he is. It's Mac. Stephen, never stand for an accountant. Never stand up. I've been watching you the whole time. Uh, sorry, what's your name, sorry? Harry from Car. Okay, so I'll just trans uh, translate that. <laughs> this is Stephanie from London. <laughs> sorry, that was for the crowd, okay? I just want to say that, um, so Stephen is a fella ginge, and um, we've got a child, a son, and he's a bop off Stephen. And when Jordan, uh, one of the matches, uh, my son turned around and he goes, I want to play like Stephen. So he's inspired our son to play because, yeah. I have to ask this, I'm really, really sorry. Do you know Burners or, or not? <laughs> I'm just asking, I'm just asking. Um, where's another, here we go. When the master's here, don't feel weird that it's called the Big Jim Show. I'm in with the people. I'm a man of the people. Sorry, sir. What's your name? Uh, Morgan from Dublin. Um, I was thinking about uh, one of what I think is one of the most underrated players in Ireland, um, Finley Bealham. He wasn't capped uh, much, but he played against South Africa and scrummed against uh, Stephen in the autumn tests, and then sort of cemented his place. I just thought maybe you could like give uh, some insight into playing against him or playing with him with Mac. You're too polite. Basically, you're saying Finley Bealham handed him his ass. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Pretty much what you said, yeah. Also, got another guy. But, uh, no, so, like, I've been watching him and we played against, we played against you guys uh, over Christmas. And, um, yeah, so he's, I think he's probably one of the most improved props. And um, I think if Todd Furlong is, um, when his career comes to a bit of an end, then I think he'll definitely take over as the number one tight head. So no, I think he's improved so much and he's become a real quality tight head in World Rugby. There you go. And he was slipping. He, he, had, he, he slept. There was a couple of slips. I saw a few more other hands. Oh, his friend next door. What's your name, sir? Stephen. This is Stephen as well. It's Blues. Stephen. How are you? Um, um, Mac, my missus from Canberra, so, oh Canberra. Oh, Savage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, how did you, you get Andy Good over here? Why, why is Andy Good? Where's Andy Good? Why? 
Let's have a look. No, he's not, no. Yeah. Andrew's two sizes bigger. Have you got a question? <laughs> oh, I thought it was just a statement. That's fine. Three statements. Um, yeah, so Mac, just about the Netflix documentary, do you think we're going to get anything good out of that? <laughs> no. Um, Matt, we were talking about this backstage, weren't we? I'll, I'll, I'll let you talk I think, a little bit about I think it. The, this first one is going to be, it's going to be interesting to see what they kind of put out there and if, if, um, Netflix haven't tried anything too sneaky. I think like the more it goes on, the more you'll start to see more and more sort of thing. Um, yeah, I, honestly, I have no clue what's going to come out of that at all, really. Uh, I think some teams were a little bit more open than others, but yeah, if, um, if it comes out well, yeah, players will have more trust in it as it goes on for sure. I've got big opinions on that. I'm going to come back on the stage, uh, and you have as well, Bernard. Like we're going to come back out. So if there's any more questions, he's had enough as well. Don't worry. So, <laughs> you just have a QR code. <laughs> Do you, you know what, that's a really good question on that, and it's almost like one that I'm bored talking about because it's a space and a kind of headspace that I've been in for a long time in terms of how do you grow the game and all these things, and I put out a, a tweet, it's not even called Twitter anymore, I don't know what you call it, but there was a big article that was released in the Telegraph that the Six Nations, hold the fort, loose as fuck this is, loose as fuck, the Six Nations have agreed to put the names of the players on the back of the shirt. <laughs> madness eh? absolute madness like we are crazy as a sport in some of the stuff that we do we are so old-fashioned um, and I know that Netflix have come in and they film behind the scenes of the Six Nations so you think about what went on the last Six Nations right where Scotland should have won the Grand Slam but we didn't so you've got Ireland on for the Grand Slam you've got the great Johnny Sexton, you've got a team that are world number one, that, are, that are, everything is gearing towards the World Cup. You've got a team like Wales, who are perceived to be on the demise, you've got Warren Gatlin back in, you've got all the off-field drama that's happening, it's absolute chaos. So you've got all these stories, right, that are happening. You've got France with a crazy Fabian Gautier, you've got Anton Dupont, the world's best player, host nations of the World Cup. And I, I just find it crazy that the doors were not opened. Like, drive, I've got a big opinion on this. Like, drive to survive in Formula One. Like, you look at what they did and the amount of money that was pumped into that. We're a sport for whatever reason. We are so old fashioned. And I know that you're different because you're, you're open. Maybe it's because you're Australian. I don't know. By a heart. Australian heart, not blood. Irish blood. But in the, this side of the world, Bernard, especially, mate, we are so old school and backwards, as in this documentary could be phenomenal. Think about how good it could be. And I saw a, a, a tweet came out from the Six Nations, and the tweet was, who do you want to see in this doc? So remember the doc's already been filmed, it's all been edited, it's all been rubber stamped by all the coaches, and then the Six Nations put a tweet out, who do you want to see? Who do you think they fucking said they want to see? They want to see Owen Farrell, they want to see Johnny Sexton, Right, they want to see Anton Dupont, they want to see the carnage in Wales. I can categorically tell you, you ain't fucking getting any of them, right? You're getting Finley and Mac doing the braids of each other's hairs, talking about that. Which will be great content, by the way. Which will be great content. You'll get out of here either. Yeah, but it's interesting, Mac. So, as in, like, and again, th th this isn't about opening up like anything because there needs to be a shift. Like, Ireland are one of the worst at it, like, in terms of giving you access. I remember at the World Cup, let me just say one more thing, I think it was the game against South Africa, so we had this drone footage, I say we, great direction of World Rugby, horrendous, it looks great on LinkedIn, um, there was this drone footage that came over the island players, and it was Peter Omani giving this, uh, uh, like, it was not the garden Peter Omani, as in the fucking rough Munsterman, Peter, Peter Omani, giving this team talk, we had the audio and everything, and it was absolutely phenomenal, it gave you a snapshot of what it, one, it looked like, it, what it meant to play for Ireland, it, it took you into the heart of one of the biggest games Ireland have ever had. It gave you access to the, the, the visuals, the athlete, everything. Put it up on social media and the IRFU came in straight and said that needs to come down immediately. We don't want any of that up there at all. Which I thought was absolutely <laughs> mental. So I'm, I'm interested, Matt, because you were involved in the dot. I know that you've probably done a little bit. Like How much access was there, really? So when this comes out and there's this big talk about it, like, are we getting to see Johnny Sexton? Um, well, yeah, I'm pretty sure he had no choice in it because he's captain and he's Johnny and I think everybody knows that you want to see Johnny. But I, see, I, I, I didn't have too much to do with it, to be honest. Like, 
Um, there were there's certain people that was picked out to do it. Um, so it's not like you're getting massive things out of everybody in the squad. I guess I can tell you that. Um, but as I said, it's it's hard to it's hard to say because it's the first time that it's been done. So it's hard to I don't know. That's coming from me as a player and being in amongst it. Um, there's also it's hard because you can't have. There's a lot of tactics that are being talked that you you just can't show stuff like that. Unfortunately, it's, I don't think it's ever really going to be shown because you know we don't want. We we have a game plan that works well against South Africa, and we want to use it again. You can't just have it sprayed all over the board, and that's the only time one and done you can use it. So it's a little bit. I find it's a little bit different in that sort of way compared to the. Um, I haven't watched Drive to Survive to be honest, so I don't know if, what the go is with it. But um, as I said, I think once we kind of see how it goes and um, everybody starts being more and more comfortable with it, I think that you will start to see a lot more. Um, if they continue the series, and just, I think it would be great to, to keep filming it and keep doing it. Um, it's just hard to know and go off something that's never been done before, to be honest. I'm being a bit harsh, I think. But you I think you're being a bit harsh, yeah. Yeah, maybe I am being a bit harsh, but I'm just going based on what we see. But you look at like other sports, you look at full swing. <laughs> it's cricket. <laughs> um, look at full swing, dry survive, and it, it isn't necessarily about the people in this room who love their rugby or now love their rugby. It's about the younger generation coming through and all of these things. It's the commercial value in it. Like, what are your views I think, on that stuff? I think it's ironic because even though the world is more open, you have platforms to tell your story, the game's actually got more closed. So if you think about a lot of the coaches who were coaching Six Nations probably watched Living With Lines or some of them played in that uh, or whatever. And it was a first insight into what is happening in the dressing, what's being said, not tactics, but the emotional side of it. And now it's getting harder and harder. People don't want to give that away. And we're speaking to Converted here because Mac is very good at telling this story. Stephen's telling the story. You're out there trying to find interesting people um, and what makes them tick. You know, we had CA, we had Jack. There are people who are obviously open, but the problem is they're nearly outliers. You know, there's 90% of, of the players, I feel, are afraid to to beat them, not, not afraid to beat themselves, but the Irish squad and, and, and the Springboks. I couldn't believe we were pitch side for some of the World Cup games and probably the most friendliest, most open team were the box. Ireland were, Ireland were really good, but the box were unbelievable. Unbelievable. And no suspect, um, I suppose, the, the stigma or the stereotype would be that the box were closed. You know what I mean? But the culture you have is incredibly open, incredibly relaxed, and uh, I bought into that. And your nation followed it, but also other nations who maybe would have been skeptical or critical of the type of rugby you played actually forgot about that and actually just started to follow the characters and the personalities and whether that's coaches or players. So like I firmly believe people follow people and like the fact you've all come here on a was a Tuesday night to listen to obviously legends of the game. Um is is it <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it proves that. And the people who listen to the podcast, uh, you know, they follow people who are interesting. And I, I think we're doing a terrible job of, of selling the game. I think the game is fucking good, right? And there's some great people playing it, great people coaching it. And we do need change, or else we'll get, we'll get swallowed up because other sports are, are moving on. So that, uh, I'm not, uh, safety issue and stuff is, is, is a serious issue, but the bigger issue for me is actually the people who love rugby, you know, promoting the game. And I, I'm speaking to Converted here, but that's the challenge. And it takes, and you know what, sometimes the players, the players don't even know what's been blocked higher up by media people or, you know, media officers and stuff like that. And that's a shame, that's a shame. Say so what, next time Kevin Doris is in Vegas at the Gymnastic Performance Center, I'm gonna ask him if we could do a live stream. <laughs> Next island captain, it's going to blow up. I saw a few questions, oh, there we go, at the back. There he is, on second. He looks hard, he's bold. That's fine. <laughs> Just look hard. Yes, sir, Jim Coffey. As in Jim, the training Jim. Uh, it's actually a question for you, Jim. Um, one of my major memories of you playing, and it was, you talk about old school, one of the best shamazzles ever. London Irish, the rest of Gloucester, talk us through that one. 
Well, that's my legacy. So, uh, <laughs> people who don't know me, my name is Jim Hamilton, one of the greatest Scots who've ever done it. But you know, that's my legacy. So now, the, the, this is the thing. See, I know you've done your research, and if you go on YouTube, and my lad's 13, he's 13 today, teenager, had a boy. So, I've been telling my kids that their dad is a fucking legend, right? So, you know, walking around, it's like, oh, Jim Hamilton and that former Scotland vice captain and stuff like that. So you feed him, feed him the information to the kids. So my lad's 13 now. Anyone who's got kids know that they live their lives on social media. So my lad's now telling his mates at school, my dad, Jim Hamilton, former Scotland captain, 63 caps, legend. Get YouTube out. Where are the tries? <laughs> Big hits? No. There's one video on there. Well, actually, there's a compilation. It's called... Rugby's biggest thugs, right? <laughs> and that's the headline one of me basically um, beating up a London Irish, a bit like you, London Irish Australian. There was a, a, a hooker called David Pace. No, you've heard of him. And it was my first day as Glo Gloucester captain. I was vice captain of Scotland. I don't know if I've said that. Um, first day as Gloucester captain, and we're playing against London Irish, who were one of the worst teams in the league at the time. And we get in, it was a close game, it was like 47 points to 8 or something. And this lad's giving me a bit, a bit of chip, and as captain, it's like, well, what's going on here? And then I remember, like, nothing, I went for a charge down, he's pulled on my jersey. Then we had a bit of a kind of, we, we called it handbags back then, you can't say that now, but handbag, it was the handbags back then. And we got called over to the ref, got, both got kind of yellow card. And I saw this, and you'll see all the great captains like Alan Wynne Jones, you'll see Sia Khaleesi do it. Martin Johnson used to do it down on their haunches like that, so I thought I'm going to do the same. So I went over to the ref and I bent over like that. I like to talk to the ref, it's like humility, so it's just showing that you're not the dominant alpha, right? So as I've done that, this David Pace lad, I know you've all heard of him, one of the hardest players I've ever done it, has come and knee drop me. You don't see this on the YouTube clip, he's knee dropped me in the, in the cop six like that and almost buckled me. I'm like, what? So I'm thinking, how are you doing that to the Gloucester captain, Scott, um, the, the vice captain of Scotland, right? So as we're walking off, I've said, in my mind, okay, I said, if he says anything more, he's having it, right? And he said something, I don't know, he said like, something about, about your mum or something like that. And he, I remember just like, as in grabbed him and then just, I, they couldn't, my nickname was Spongebob Hands or Sponge Hands, Sponge Fist, but I just hit, connected with, a, with a, a really good shot and it's my legacy. So basically, if you were to YouTube me, don't add to the algorithm because the kids will start seeing it. Oh, actually, another one as well. So I played for Scotland against uh, South Africa in Nailsbury. It was Sia Khaleesi's first game. And any Scotland fans in here, I know there's a few. We were, we were beating South Africa in Nailsbury, Heineken Mare, his hometown of South Africa. And then I, I saw this, I heard this like young whippersnapper, Evan Esabeth, so he basically said I was shy. He was right, but I didn't take it. And I pushed him in the face. Like, it was an open amp. I mean, it was the most powerful thing you've ever seen in your life. And I ended up getting sent off and Scotland lose. But anyway, that's my legacy. There were a couple of questions I saw at the back. I'm coming across. How long have we got, Stephen? We're 15. Thank you. He's the boss. Thanks for life. Sorry about you. There you go. Name, sir? Uh, Ruben. I'm from Clare. Um, I, I lived down in Galway for about a year, and uh, Mac, if you go into Ampupan, there's like a little thing called the Bundy Booth. Oh God, hang on. <laughs> Clean. I don't know too much about the Bundy Booth, I don't know where that came from, but uh, just wondering, like, do you spend much time in the Bundy Booth, or is there anywhere in particular, uh, anywhere in particular you spend in Galway? You know, the funny thing, the Bundy Booth is always packed with people, so I've actually never sat in it. It's no, literally, it's always full to the brim. I love um, that, deny, deny. No, I'd love, I'd love to spend time in the Bundy booth, but it's, it's a hot commodity. I don't know if you line up early for it or what, but um, whenever I go in there, it's always jam-packed. Yeah, people love the Bundy booth. Me included. Stay out of the Bundy booth. We've got a question over the back. Just want to put the hand up here, close to me. I'm going through. All right. You're a bad lad. In the Bundy booth. This is quite interactive. Hey, Greg, you know. Who, where are we? You're hiding in the corner. This is a good one, right? Uh, Brendan from Wicklow. Uh, what's the funniest thing you've seen or heard on a rugby pitch? Banter. Here we go, lads. Bird, it may be one for you. So, so, funniest thing that you've heard okay. on, on a rugby pitch? Go on, Bird. Yeah, so it's back to, and I'll throw Trevor Brennan under the bus. But, um, so, Trevor Brennan was unbelievably hard, right? But, uh, he didn't have great skills and he, and he, um, 
He signed from Leicester to Toulouse, right? And the first two or three games, Toulouse were playing this offloading game. He fucking dropped every pass he got, right? So he got dropped by Guy Noves. So Toulouse are playing Stade Francais in Stade de France. Actually, that's that's the big derby. So Munster v Leinster in Ireland. Um, over there, it's uh, Stade, Stade Francais back in the day against Toulouse. So 80,000 people, right? Trevor's dropped because he can't catch the ball, right? So first half's not going well. And at halftime, Guy Noves comes over to him and says, Trevor, do the entree, right? So you're going to come on. And Trevor, wee, 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 wee. And he goes, un boot. So one, one, one goal, right? And to do eliminate Gonzalo Casada, right? So <laughs> Gonzalo Casada had kicked five penalties on the drop goal, right? So he, to do eliminate, so you've got to get rid of um, Gonzalo Casada. And Trevor goes, for the match or for the season? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, 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 apparently, apparently Guy Lopez was like shitting himself, right? So he's like, just for the match, just for the second half, right? I spoke better, like all the Frenchies, they can speak good English when they fucking want, right? So, um, so anyway, they were down in the, they're underneath the, the, the stadium, whatever. So Trevor says, grabs the fitness coach, he says, come on, right? So they go up to the side of the pitch, because he was coming on straight away. So you're doing this drill, basically, where you tackle the tackle bag, you dive on the ground, jump up, other shoulder, right? But then he fucking clip the, the fitness guy's elbow, right? So he knocked himself out, right? So he was fucking doing like this, where, and uh, he saw the team run out, right? And he's like, fuck, I can't tell Keen Oves, I've got knocked out. Uh, I was supposed to be the hard man of the team. I better go on, right? So he kind of jogged onto the field and uh, he said, I've got about five minutes here to knock Gonzalo Casada out before, before I have to go off, right? So he saw a rook <laughs> over there anyway, and he was full sure he saw Gonzalo Casada, right? So he just went flying, fucking jumped, right? And whatever. And he's the next thing he woke up and there was, Many people, 28 people fighting, right? Um, <laughs> and eventually the referee stops the fight and he comes over, or Fabian Pelous, who's the French captain, big man, 100, 100 caps, comes over, grabs Trevor and he's there, Trevor, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Trevor, it's okay, man, he knows about it, right? Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, Fabian Pelous is like, what? What? And he's like, it's okay, Guy told me to do it, right? And he goes, Trevor, regard the bat, right? Look over there, right? Um, Freddie Mishlak has been stretched off, right? Who <laughs> <laughs> was his own player, he broke his jaw in the street all the time, right? So, so that's, that's my story. <laughs> so old school back in the day. I, mean, I was in South Africa a few weeks ago and I was in Bulls Land. Um, back is both of like that's what I think of when I think of the Blue Bulls back in the, the Blue Bulls. We call them. There we go. Back in the day, and uh, they were talking about Bacchus Botha, and like we were talking about getting him there for the game. And as we know, Bacchus Botha looks like he's eating Bacchus Botha now. I don't know if anyone said, but don't tell him that. And obviously, deeply religious man, and he used to pray every day. Like, but if you see any clips of Bacchus before he went on, and like, he'd be down and he'd be praying. And then, so we just talking talking about Bacchus. Like, what you know? Is he like really, really religious? And he was like, oh, only when he wanted to be. And it's like, well, before you go on the pitch, like, what, what are you praying for, Bacchus? And he's like, I'm praying for forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> and I play, I played against Bacchus, right? So if you're, you're in a rock at any point, just don't put your head up. Like, just do not put your head up because someone's taking it off. But, um, Steve, is there much chat in the games now? Is there much banter? Or is it pretty kind of straight-laced? Um, is anyone giving you any stick? No. Not really, like, it's, I think it's, there's some guys, like uh, Jaden Hendricks, probably the, uh, for us it's probably even Faf the Clark is probably the guys who chat the most on the field, but uh, to be honest, like, I'm way too tired to get into fights, <laughs> or, to, or to try and talk, um, talk to people, like, I'm just focusing on trying to stay alive and trying to make it through 40 minutes and that's pretty much me like. You say that, you say that, look at the humility. The humility, just trying to stay like in the moment. Mate, you call yourself the fucking bomb squad, like as in, you know what I mean? You're going there to monster people. Let's, let's talk a little bit about that as well. I know it's going a little bit off topic, but that story was enough in itself. But this kind of bomb squad that now, just can you just open up your, your jacket just to show the millions? And there it on the chest. BS. Okay, that ain't bullshit, right? <laughs> Fucking bomb squad. You know? Imagine being part of that. How cool is that? The, the, actually, let's start with the fact you built a brand that you built a, built a beer out of the back of that, this bomb squad brand. How cool is that to be a part of? Like, because back in the day, the subs were called, like anything, they were called like 
the mixed veg, they were called like the shags, the bit juice. Like you're on the bench, basically you're on the bench because you weren't good enough to start and there was nothing no one else. But now, South Africa have made it cool. The Springboks have made it cool. Just talk to us a little about, about how that is spawned into what it is. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> Rassi came to us and said, like, it was between me and B's for the 2019 World Cup and he came to us and, and asked, like, me and B sitting in a room together and he's like, listen, uh, one of you are going to start and one of you are going to play off the bench. Uh, you guys can decide who, who does that. And B stands up and like, no, I'm starting. And I was like, okay, cool, I'll play off the bench. And, then, <laughs> and the same happened to Malcolm and, and Vincent as well. And, um, yeah, and so we were playing, like in the World Cup, and we were playing, and, and so uh, Franco Moster put, put up a video on, on one of the groups, and it was uh, DeAndre Wilder, and he screamed, Bomb Squad! It's like, okay, cool, we're gonna call ourselves a Bomb Squad from there. And it just like it kept on developing and developing, and like the Springboks, I mean, kept picking the same guys, and went from a 5 3 split into a 6 2 split, and then which is 7-1 split and it just kept on evolving and, um, and, me, and Malcolm were, me and Malcolm were roommates and also Louis Cannon when he gets on the beers you can't stop him like he just goes flat out um, and we were sitting in the room one night and it's like uh, we best mates in the team and I asked him like listen are we gonna like do a business together like, like keep this friendship alive in the future and he's like um, you know what do you feel like I was like oh, let's do a beer we both drink shit ton of beer um, <laughs> we, um, it's like a oh, cool idea, and like six months before the World Cup, we just started it and uh, actually took took off in South Africa, and yeah, well, we're proud owners of Bombsquad Lager. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the fact that Scott and Arnold, so you basically thanking me for the help building your brand because if it wasn't for that initial clip and Scotland beat South Africa, you wouldn't have even made it through to the quarterfinals, and the Bomb Squad would be no more. Absolutely no more. Uh, Mac, with, let's just kind of, we're, we're going to wrap it up in a minute, but first kind of long-term injury for you, I know it's probably a really difficult time to answer this because you're like just out of surgery and stuff, but for the people in here, like your career, the trajectory has been like that, you've been phenomenal, uh, you've added real value when you've been getting man of the match for the, the media side of things, but how does the next few months being injured like look for you, are you going to take some time to reflect, uh, I mean... Are you going to be doing stuff off the field? Because like we, what we don't want to do is lose Matt Hampton throughout the Six Nations. We want to use you for whatever's possible because you're such a, such a character. Um, it's, it's been a day, so I haven't really thought about it. Oh, no. <laughs> can we go, basically, what I'm asking, Matt, is can we go, just go and do a tour somewhere and just get yeah, loose for that. four yeah, months? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd love to, to do that with you, Jim. Yeah, we'll do that. So before we go, and Bernard, we'll maybe just finish with you just on the kind of the state of rugby at the minute. But Mac, as a Red Bull athlete, Stephen, future Red Bull athlete, a Guinness athlete. Peshaw's <laughs> <Best shots. laughs> a good shipper. Though. Is it? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm an ambassador for them. Anything. If you're, if, you're, hey, if you're an anything athlete, I love that. I'm an ambassador. Not even an athlete, it's just an ambassador. Snack box, snack box. But Mac, just your association with being a Red Bull athlete but wings for life and everything I'm basically going to get you to do the promo as well and anything that you miss out I'm just going to add on but how cool is it to have the association with that as a, as a, as a young athlete doing what you're doing yeah look it's it's kind of hard to follow see he's spoken pretty well about it to be honest but no it, um, yeah, I don't know what else to say like he's he's kind of covered it all didn't he like it the way he spoke was so passionate and so um, you know thankful for the position he's in to be able to help and that's exactly how I feel and Red Bull has um, has loads of charities they work with, but this year it is a really special one to to um, to be helping people in need. And as you said, it, we can you can do it anywhere in the world. It's not just a, a one off thing. Um, so yeah. It's yeah. So great. with that, so what Max saying? So if you've got friends that are in Australia, if you've got friends that uh, are, are in India, or you've got friends that are in America, basically if you've got friends anywhere, like even if you haven't got friends, just pretend you've got friends. But they're running this globally. So you'll find all the information like digitally on the app. There's going to be like a virtual kind of chaser card that's going to chase you along the way. There's going to be people. Matt, I don't know if you know that you're doing this, but you're going to be motivating people across the world as they're on this run of terror, of goodness, is, is what I'm going to say. So there's loads of stuff that's happening around it. And again, as you probably saw by the 
the intro that I had. I thought I had it prepped in my mind to talk about um, the Wings for Life and the world run that's happening. I've got the QR code, as we know. Okay, I've got the date, which is May the 5th. But I just think more so, it's just like a big thanks for people that have turned up for a little bit of entertainment this evening. But just to say that every time if you go into the app or you send it to your friends, you get an Adi Das, not Adi Hash t-shirt, just to reiterate that. But all the funds, all the funds go into the pot to help find a cure, to help research. And as I said, like, I've got three friends that have been affected by this, like Matt Hampson. They actually changed. Do you remember back in the day where they had the scrums they, where they used to call Crouch, Bind, Engage, or Crouch, Touch, Bind, Engage? I can't remember. They moved the, the Engaged from, from that because of the distance to the scrum, because of the injury that Matt got. I said the most common way that people break their necks is diving into a seat. 17 year old lad, Henry Fraser. Uh, who's now a mouth artist, and we were talking about it, is they live in hope, right, that there's going to be uh, a cure down the line. So this initiative that we've partnered with tonight, it's absolutely amazing to be here in Dublin to be able to do that. And, yeah, I've, I've got nothing more to say on that apart from just give the great Bernard Jackman a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, 83 caps for the Springboks, two back-to-back -back World Cups, a championship for South Africa, a URC. Basically, we're sat here with rugby greatness, an absolute legend. He's at Ulster. It's awesome that you can have a here. If I had your stats as well, you would have got around the board right now. I just thought I'd love the iPad somewhere as well. Nine, nine caps, eight off the bench, yeah. There you go, absolutely. Um, and also, Matt Cazzo, talking you up here, mate, the fact that you've turned up tonight, I know that you are a Red Bull athlete, but you were having surgery yesterday. You know, we, we've had shoulder injuries, surgeries and stuff like that. So it's fucking not, it, it, it's a tough one to get through. But I think with, everyone can agree, with especially where the game is now and Ireland till you die, Scotland till you die, I think it's completely undeniable, Matt coming from Australia, from the outside looking in, what he's done for the Irish jersey, the way that you've played in that jersey, in the green jersey, how you represent yourself and your family is absolutely amazing. And the Irish fans in here, you should like I, I imagine you're absolutely buzzing to have someone like Matt Hansen in the Irish squad and for him to come to us. So <laughs> Thank you everyone, thanks for everyone for turning up, and the thanks to the Sugar Club as well. It was Sinead O'Connor, it's now the Big Jim Show live, I just said it again. Thank you.